Will we finally see some crazy tight end drafting at the top of the board? Who will throw ADP to the wind and get their guys? And can Mike Beers become the first ever pro to win a second Pros vs. Joe's overall title? Follow along with the live draft board tonight and listen to our pick-by-pick analysis as we call the action from the 2020 FFPC Pros vs. Joe's Macho Man League Number 6 to see who will win a 2021 FFPC main event team. We've got a great show for you. Dave Gerzak is here. I'm Eric Balkman. Stick around. Your high-stakes fantasy football hour starts Let's now. Let's begin now. New cologne on. Feeling so good. Change the color to my bone. Orange Kool-Aid go good with Patron. Oh, hell no. It's still my ringtone. Free car watch. Had to clean up the dot. Get back when I can. Just play my part. Church folks had a fist rap. Mustard. Hot sauce. Broadcast live and heard around the world, you are now listening to the most entertaining hour of radio on the planet. It's the High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour presented by MyFFPC.com with your hosts, Eric Balkman and Dave Gerzak. The High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour is your home for football analysis from the best fantasy players in the world. And now, because no one else was available, here are Eric Balkman and Dave Gerzak. Thank you so much, Rob. Greetings and salutations to all of the Balkaholics and Gerzak and addicts tuning in to the broadcast this evening or downloading uh, via your podcast avenue of choice later on welcome to the latest episode of the high stakes fantasy football hour it is as always presented by my ffpc.com i'm your slightly above average host eric balkman and my co-host is the patron saint of fantasy football dave the dizzle gerzak tonight we have the last of six special episodes for you it is the ffpc pros versus joe's macho man league number six draft tonight we'll be covering it for its duration you can follow the live draft board at youtube.com slash high stakes fantasy football uh shout out to the chat room right now you guys can post any questions you might have in there uh the show is at hsff hour on twitter i am at eric balkman dave is at david gerzak facebook.com slash hsff hour is where to reach us there and if you want to call us tonight Feel free, 347-426-3682. That's 347-GAME-OVA. Football at gmail.com is where you can reach us as well. Our audio engineer and my best friend Bryce, as well as our producer and mutual friend Rob, getting those questions and tweets and emails to us throughout the broadcast tonight. Uh, remember, if you already have an FFPC main event team, you can get $400 off each additional team that you add on. So make sure that you are taking advantage of that. Remember, the next round of early draft slots, I believe, is not this coming Monday, but it will be the following Monday, August 17th. If you are all paid up by then, squared away, you'll have your draft slot by August 19th. That's that Wednesday. So take advantage of that, myffpc.com. Tonight, final draft, here is the lineup for Pros versus Joe's Macho Man League number six. Drafting first, the three-time main event league winner, Brian Pakula, followed by Roto Grinders' Chris Prince in the two spot. A two-time main event and football guys uh, champion, Todd Hopkins in the three-hole, followed by our good buddy, Michael Nazarick from Fantasy Football Mastermind. James Boris, a two-time casher in the FFPC Playoff Challenge, is in the five spot, followed by the godfather of the Pros versus Joe's. It's Fantasy Mojo's Darren Armani. Peter St. Pierre and Steve Ashey, the FFPC main event league champs, are in the seventh spot. 2017 overall Pros versus Joe's champ Mike Beers from Rotoviz is drafting eighth. A two-time football guys and dynasty champ with the FFPC and a former Pros versus Joe's league winner, Sky Eilers is drafting ninth right in front of Howard Bender from Fantasy Alarm in the 10 spot. Former football guys league champ Brian Tuminello is 11th. And then Jeff Manns from Guru Elite is drafting 12th tonight. We're already through the first round. Want to bring you up to speed on what went down. Pakula goes McCaffrey, number one. Prince takes Barkley, number two. Todd Hopkins is uh, going to go with a running back there, Ezekiel Elliott, over Alvin Kamara, who Michael Nazarick takes with the four spot. 
His real-life teammate, Michael Thomas, goes to James Boris at the five, and then we have a glut of running backs here. Dalvin Cook to Darren Armani. Uh, Joe Mixon to St. Pierre and Ashy, followed by Clyde Edwards-Hilaire to Mike Beers from Rotoviz. Sky Eilers then take, uh, excuse me, takes Derek Henry, and then Nick Chubb wraps up that little running back run. Michael Thomas was the only receiver taken in the first round. Uh, it's because Travis Kelsey went to Brian Tuminello and Jeff Manns took George Kittle. A couple of tight ends going in the first round tonight. I, I guess a f- philosophical question here, Dave. Normally when we have these pros versus Joes competitions in the past, uh, we have seen some pros not necessarily familiar with ADP and the FFPC, uh, and we have seen some Joes that maybe haven't drafted a ton of teams, and we see some pretty wild first rounds. Outside of one one night this week, I think the first round's been pretty chalky. Does that surprise you at all, given what we've seen in the past in this competition? Oh, no, it's a, I mean, I guess it's a little unusual to be usual. So right, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's worked out all right. I, it feels like, um, has Kittle moved up in ADP a little bit in the last um, month or so? Because it seems like Kittle, I thought he was more of a mid-second round pick, but it seems like he's right, right near Kelsey in most of these drafts. Yeah, he uh, he went up after the Debo Samuel injury. We saw uh, him going of course, that makes sense. in the uh, in the first round a lot in the FFPC Best Ball Slim ADP, uh, which is brought to you by Fantasy Mojo. Uh, make sure you're checking out FantasyMojo.com for all your FFPC ADP uh, needs as well as draft boards, everything there. FantasyMojo.com. Darren Armani does a great job with that, and that's probably why he's going to crush this draft tonight as well. Uh, George Kittle is going at the 201 over the last week. There, that's over two dozen drafts worth of uh of knowledge of of a sample size kittle has gone as high as the 108 as low as the 205 he it seemed like he was a mid-second round pick until the samuel news hit and then he was sort of like that one two turn type guy and i feel like if you like tight ends you're going to make sure that if you're drafting on the back end you're going to get either kelsey or kittle kelsey slips a little bit tonight uh to brian Tuminalo. he normally goes at the 108 he falls to the 111 tonight with such an emphasis on the first round running backs dave and i think that's how i will be approaching the majority of my drafts this year i would love to take michael thomas um but i i just you know with all the receiver value later on and, and trying to get one of those bell cow three down running backs I, I i i just feel like the best way to spend a first round pick unless michael thomas slips uh, or if i'm in the back end and i'm in a tight end premium is is one of those top running backs including clyde edwards hilaire too yep I, I do agree with you uh, that was a good point by the uh, who was it last night um do we call him the pod father or whatever? Oh, Matt Kelly. Yeah. Matt yeah. Kelly bringing up that, you know, Michael Thomas, he just says he can't take him there and he made some good points. I, I thought uh, that was pretty insightful. Yeah, it was great. It was, uh, I think we started a nice little rivalry between Matt Kelly and Mike Leone last night um, between uh player profiler and uh, of course, established the run as we got both those guys to call in. Yeah, that was fun. We got the argument and the rebuttal, which was tremendous. All right, on to the second round here. Devontae Adams to Jeff Manns at the 201. Tyree Kill to Brian Tuminello at the 202 as he goes back-to-back Chiefs. Stay tuned to see what he does in the third round here. This could get interesting, ladies and gentlemen, or maybe not as I look further on in the second round. So forget it. DeAndre Hopkins to Howard Bender at the 203, and then another running back run here. Uh, This is uh, four straight teams that started off with two running backs. Sky Eilers pairs uh, Derrick Henry and uh, Miles Sanders together here at the 204. Kenyon Drake is Mike Beers' selection to go along with Clyde Edwards-Alaire in the first round. Joe Mixon and Josh Jacobs is how St. Pierre and Ashy uh, have their drafts and then or have their draft go. Austin Eckler to Darren Armani. Eckler in the same backfield for Fantasy Mojo as Dalvin Cook here. Uh, Patrick Mahomes ruining the dream for uh, for Brian Tuminello in the 11 spot. Patrick Mahomes goes to James Boris uh, at the 208 tonight, uh, which is interesting because of all those running backs that went in the first two rounds, Boris is the only two, well, I shouldn't say he's the only team. Uh, he is one of three teams that did not grab a running back in the first two rounds. Julio Jones after that to Michael Nazarek, followed by Aaron Jones. Once again, Julio Jones, Aaron Jones, back-to-back, I think in the exact same spots, too, here at the 209 and 210, respectively. Mark Andrews at the 211 tonight, followed by Chris Godwin at the 212 to Brian Pakula. McCaffrey and Godwin is the way he starts off. So, Dave, now just looking at this, um, draft, we have four teams, uh, six through nine here, sort of in the middle. Um, 
that all started off with two straight running backs. So you'd like to think that teams 10, 11, and 12 can sort of play off that a little bit here and, and maybe catch some running back value because I'm betting that there's going to be a lot of um, uh, wide receivers and, and probably a few tight ends going in the next three or four rounds here to teams six through nine. Sort of changes the back end and the complexion of this draft for those three teams. Yeah, although you could also make the argument that teams like team eight, nine, ten 10 uh, might want to dra- grab a running back because teams 11 and 12 don't have running backs. So if I was, like, if I, for example, if I was team eight, nine, or 10, and I was looking at running back and a receiver, like I was going to go running back receiver or receiver running back, I would take a third back here to kind of, you know, I don't want to say screw over teams 11 and 12, but to, uh, <laughs> right. to, have, to uh, have that advantage over them. Um, I'm looking here at the ADP for DeAndre Hopkins. Howard Bender ends up taking him about a half round ahead of where he normally goes uh, in uh, in getting his man in Hopkins there at the 203. He wasn't going to get him in the third round at the 310, so he got his guy right there as the fourth wide receiver off the board tonight. Um, another trend I've noticed, and I don't know if you have any feelings on this, Dave, of how you would handle this if you were going to go quarterback early. If for the best ball slim ADP, um, Patrick Mahomes and Lamar Jackson are now essentially going back to back. Lamar Jackson was going about a round ahead of Mahomes. And, and I would say for FFPC drafters there, you know, he's not only caught up to him, but in pros versus Joe's drafts, it seems like we've seen Mahomes go ahead of Lamar Jackson uh, in, in the majority of these drafts so far. At least if, half of them, it seems like. Yeah, uh, that it surprises me a little bit. I would still be taking Lamar Jackson over Patrick Mahomes. Where would you fall in on that if you were going to take a quarterback early? Uh, would it be Mahomes or would it be Jackson? Or would it kind of depend what you did before that in the draft? I'd probably take Lamar Jackson. I feel pretty comfortable with him. With the rushing upside and the high floor, I'm good with him. Yeah, I, I just... Mahomes just does not represent uh, the, the the dual threat that that Lamar Jackson is, and I don't think that changes uh, this year at all. Too, I think uh, Lamar Jackson has another banner year. Could go back to back with the MVP too, uh, as we see how that goes. Um, Devonte Adams versus Tyree Kill as the number two wide receiver. Dave, um, we've seen uh, he'll he'll go ahead of Adams a couple of times. Most of the time. Adams goes ahead of him. Obviously, Adams should get a pretty big target share. Tyreek Hill, maybe the ex- more explosive playmaker, definitely on the more explosive offense. You made up your mind on going receiver at that uh, one-two turn. Are you going Adams or Tyreek Hill in the majority of your drafts? Uh, I've always been like a big – I've just been a huge Tyreek Hill fan, so I guess I'm, going, I'm sticking with Tyreek Hill. Uh, I love – I mean, Adams is – you know, I really need to get Adams in a few spots this year. Though. Do you own him in any dynasty leagues, curiously? No, no, no? I don't. Okay. Uh, Unfortunately, you, I don't think I do. No, I own him in one. I own him in one dynasty league. Maybe I can make it happen. I think that was a good time to buy in on him for sure. All right. So let's move on to the third round here. Brian Pakula with a, a rainbow start here, running back receiver and now quarterback as Lamar Jackson is the first pick of the third round uh, going at the three Oh one Todd Gurley right after that to Chris Prince as his second running back. Uh, he pairs Gurley with Saquon Barkley, his pick at 102. Todd Hopkins now has a receiver. His name is Mike Evans, and he goes at the 303. Zach Ertz, the fourth tight end off the board tonight, uh, following in line with ADP here. Zach Ertz is the 304 selection, followed by Leonard Fournette, first running back drafted by James Boris. He uh, goes Michael Thomas, Patrick Mahomes, and now Leonard Fournette. DJ Moore, first receiver drafted by Darren Armani, the 2019 FFPC High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour. Hype guy, getting hyped up again this year as Moore goes at the 306 tonight. Uh, one of two teams to start off with three straight running backs tonight. The first is Peter St. Pierre and Steve Ashey, Joe Mixon, Josh Jacobs in the first two rounds. Now Chris Carson here in the third. Mike Beers goes Kenny Galladay uh, after he takes CEH and Kenyon Drake in the first two rounds. Galladay is his number one receiver. Of course, you remember Beers won this competition three years ago. Sky Eilers, a guy who won uh, his own pros versus Joe's league in 2018, uh, he starts off with three straight running backs, Henry, Miles Sanders, and now Jonathan Taylor here in the third round. James Conner after that to Howard Bender. And then uh, Conner's real-life teammate, Juju Smith-Schuster, to Brian Tuminello. And Odell Beckham, the final pick of the third round to Jeff Manns from uh, Guru Elite there. Uh, and we are three rounds in. We have four tight ends off the board. We have two quarterbacks off the board. 
Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 12 receivers, and then the rest are all running backs. That's what we're looking at there. A uh, little bit of a surprising pick here at the 401. We'll get to that uh, shortly. Um, did we, uh, I don't think we've, uh, we've talked necessarily a ton about Leonard Fournette and I just kind of want to touch on him a little bit, Dave, because I thought we talked about him last night and the night before. Did we really? I don't know. Oh, like for God's sake. All the time. This is unbelievable. Well, I, he, was, I mean, he was, you know, he was, uh, he was cheap like, a couple nights ago. Oh, we did talk about him. Yeah. Um, <laughs> do you remember how many passes he caught in 2019? I know it was a lot. It was more than 60. I don't know if he hit the 70 threshold. Uh, I don't know offhand. I could, you know, look it up, of course. If I, he, I think he's going to be catching fewer people. That, that's sort of, sort of what I was going to ask you is where you thought how, how many passes he would catch in 2020 this year. Is, is 40 attainable for him? Is, is 50 attainable for him with Chris, uh, Chris Thompson, as you mentioned? Well, is Chris Thompson, I mean, is he actually going to be healthy all year? I mean, he, he never. He's, My he, guess he, is no. <laughs> yeah, just, he seems like kind of washed up a little bit, I mean, or a lot of it. Henry Mudo chiming in in the chat room. Uh, 76 is how many passes uh, Leonard Fournette caught last year. Um, let, me, yeah. let, me ask, let me ask you this. Okay. So he caught 76 passes last year. Do you think he's going to have three touchdowns this year? No, I don't. I think he's going to have more. So there you go. So if he drops on to 50, I think maybe he has eight, 10, eight, 10 touchdowns. Yeah. You know, he'll, be, he'll be fine. Did you see that Gardner Minshew uh, COVID-19 comment? No. <laughs> He said that the coronavirus came after him, and as soon as it saw Gardner Minshew, the virus turned around and ran away. That's pretty funny. <laughs> oh, only from Gardner Minshew. I love it. Oh, yeah. Absolutely you saw Stafford stuff. had a false positive. I did see that, too, which, yeah. is, which is good news uh, for sure. I, I, it seems like there's um, – well, whatever. I don't want to get into it. <laughs> a lot of false positives out there. Um, okay, so uh, I don't really have anything else to say about the third round here, Dave. Um, when you look at uh, the decision that Sky Eilers was faced with here, uh, with uh, you know knowing he's going to go running back, he could have had Jonathan Taylor, he could have had James Conner, he could have had Melvin Gordon, um, and, and he went with the league winner in, in Jonathan Taylor. I feel like it's um, just I'm ingrained in my DNA to go with the, the guy that is younger, who's unproven, um, who um, you know, has not had the injury history that James Conner has had. Is that the right choice there to go with Jonathan Taylor? And, and does it make a difference if you're drafting in the FPC or the FFPC main event to go with the rookie Jonathan Taylor over James Conner there? Oh, uh, you know, that's a good question. Uh, you know, Conner's got, you know, Conner's got some uncertainty, you know, just, he does have an injury history. He was never like this truly pedigree back. Whereas Taylor is, they spent a high draft capital on him. And I, I think he will be productive. Their offensive line is fantastic. Uh, he does have to deal with two other running backs in Marlon Mack and Naeem Hines as a pass catcher. So that's one of the things that does limit him. I probably would have gone receiver receiver there possibly. Um, but if I was going running back, I could see the, I could see the case. I mean, you know, the, actually another run, running back that went later, David Johnson is probably who I would have gone with actually. No, I'm thinking about Yeah. He just, uh, well, that's really interesting. We'll have to, uh, to, um, to look at his ADP when we get to that. Uh, Henry Moto in the chat room, team 11 hates running backs. Is that Pete again, referring to Peter Overzet from uh, Sunday night, who mm-hmm. started off with a ton of uh, wideouts? By the way, he said he enjoyed listening. I don't know if you saw the tweet. He tweeted out that he really enjoyed listening to our analysis of, of his team and how we were very polite about not liking his crazy strategy. He, he put in better <laughs> words than I could have. Cool. But, yeah, he, he enjoyed listening back to it there. <laughs> um, Juju Smith-Schuster or Odell Beckham, Dave, who's more likely to bounce back and have a big year in 2020? Odell Beckham or Juju? You know, I – I, I like Juju over Beckham. I just Beckham to me has that flake factor, injured all the time. I, I just I'm just not. I, and I own him in a couple of dynasty leagues. I just I don't know. I still you've been shopping him around at all or no? No, I've been working. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I suppose it's difficult. But yeah, if I was if I you know if I felt like it, I I would yeah shop him around. But I mean you know people aren't. Really, he still does command a price for certain people. Some people will pay for him. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder here, uh, and beauty is in the eye of the Beckham lover in this case. Moving on to the fourth round here, and this is a pick I want to kick it off with. I'm excited to talk about We'll recap the whole fourth round, and we'll get back to it. But Jeff Manns actually takes the rookie out of Florida State, Cam Akers, as his number one running back at the 401 tonight. And then you get three receivers off the board right after that. Adam Thielen to Brian Tuminello, who had, now has three 
receivers, one tight end. Allen Robinson, the Howard Bender, is his second receiver. A.J. Brown now is the number one receiver for Sky Eilers here at the 404. Melvin Gordon joins a crowded backfield for Mike Beers with Clyde Edwards-Alaire and Kenyon Drake. Uh, then you have Calvin Ridley as the number one receiver for Peter St. Pierre and Steve Ashey here, the FFPC veterans uh, who draft him at the 406. You're looking at Amari Cooper right after that to Darren Armani. Uh, David Johnson to James Boris here. Uh, at the 408, uh, interesting start there where you go Michael Thomas and Patrick Mahomes and still get Fournette and David Johnson as your top two running backs. Le'Veon Bell to Michael Nazareth right after that. Uh, Cooper Cup to Todd Hopkins, Robert Woods. Boy, I see those Rams receivers, those teammates. They go back-to-back in a lot of drafts, uh, pros yeah. versus Joe so far this year. Cooper Cup and then Robert Woods to Beer Makers fan. Uh, that's Chris Prince from Roto Grinders. And then you have Darren Waller, a true room, uh, rainbow start now here for Brian Pakula. So pleasing to the eye. Green running back, yellow receiver, pink uh, quarterback or red quarterback, and then purple tight end. That rounds out uh, the fourth round. All right, so a lot of picks I want to talk about here, Dave. First of all, Cam Akers at the 401, truly a pick-to-win uh, type player. And Jeff Mann's betting on his upside, drafting him basically for his upside here. As you look at um, the the FFPC uh, slim ADP, Cam Akers normally does not come off the board until the 507. Didn't Jeff Mann's do that? Uh, who was that? Ben Tate. Remember that was a few years ago in Pros versus Joes. Where <laughs> it was just, the fourth round. It was the third or fourth round. Yeah, and yeah. and he t- and we were kind of scratching our heads like what. What is he? Because he had like a seventh round ADP. Now, this isn't that egregious, but again, drafting on the ends, I think strategy is a little bit different. You can take the value as it comes to you, or you can go out and get your guys. And and I feel like sometimes, and I don't know if this is true with you, but, you know, I'm always looking for value, but it's more important to me to get the players I target, get the players I want, Um, especially when I'm looking at it from a season long perspective. I'll I'll often try to get those guys and I'll forget where I got them. Um, But to, 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 to be drafting at the one or the two or the 11 or 12, I, I definitely put more of an emphasis on getting my guys rather than hoping value falls to me, Dave. That's interesting. I think I'm generally the opposite. Um, I, I think I generally will look more towards who might have fallen to me at the ends because I'm kind of restricted at, at one end or the other. I think that the, the important, well, I, and I do look for that too. It's not like I ignore it, but I'll say this. Um, you almost, I, I think balance is the key and, and you don't want to be left out in the cold. You kind of, kind of, you got to see these runs coming. You know, you got to take a look at ADP. You got to look at past draft boards. You got to kind of know, especially industry guys who draft against industry guys, you kind of got to know where the runs are coming to. And I, and I feel like um, that that's much more important on the ends uh, than it is in the middle. Maybe, uh, maybe I certain. have fewer guys that I, that, that I have than you do. I think you do. Yeah. I think historically, um, you have had fewer guys that you are trying to get. Um, and, and for me, there's, um, there's so many, you know, I've, I don't know if you don't listen to as many fantasy podcasts as I do. That's right. Because I listen to zero. Right? Right. Yeah. So I've been listening to a lot lately and, and there's some, and I, I can't remember if I brought this up or not. So forgive me if I did. There, there is just so much pumping up of everybody. Everybody is going to be awesome this year. There are no busts. Uh, uh, this is a great guy that, I mean, you can, like you, you wait until the third round, third round. Oh my goodness. There's 14 guys that are great there. You look in the fifth round. There's 27 guys that are make excellent fifth round pick, you know, and it's just like, not, I, I can't, I, I'm almost disgusted with the sugary positivity that's going on in a lot of these drafts. What happened to hating on people? I guess that's reserved for Twitter. Um, but, but it's just, it's so bizarre. Cause I, and that's why I think I like all these guys is because I just get in my head. Well, I like this guy because of this and this and this. And well, there's a lot of If you're listening to different podcasts too, then each, each one may have certain players that they like in the fourth round. And if you listen to six yeah. of them, now you have 10 guys. Exactly. Out of the fourth that's round a great point. Like, yeah. I, I, they like that. You're like, well, well, he made a good point. Need to take the shears to the old podcasting tree, Dave, and prune that thing down to, uh, to get it to where, where it's actually helping me. And I'm not, uh, getting a bunch of noise piped into my ears. Calvin Ridley to uh, Peter St. Pierre and Steve Ashey here, Dave, at the 406. I love the fact that they can get those three running backs and still get Calvin Ridley, who I think is a borderline top 10 receiver this year. 
Really? Yeah. Well, in top ten. Yep. I like Ridley a lot too. That's a but that's a that's a bold statement, my friend. Just trying to see where he normally goes among receivers in this format. Calvin Ridley, wide receiver fourteen. So yeah. I it's maybe not that not bold. That I, bold. Guess, but yeah, <laughs> I thought I was being bold. I guess I wasn't. I mean, it's a little bit higher. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's totally possible. Yeah, but I just I like that value there for for Saint Pierre and and uh, Ashy to get him as their number one. Uh, wide receiver David Johnson to Boris um, this is uh, a guy who normally goes at the 312 James Boris gets him tonight Dave at the 408 uh, two-thirds of a round of value there nice job there will be no levy on Bell in the fifth round tonight as Nazareth gets him there so good good on him and then Darren Waller at the end of the fourth round Darren Waller normally goes at the 502 so solid value there this is a very interesting fourth round uh, it, it's a round that we had seen over the last five pros versus Joe's drafts that were uh, dominated um, uh, by, uh, by receivers for sure. And uh, tonight we see it, uh, receivers going off the board a lot in the fourth round and in the fifth round too as, as we get to that um, uh, shortly here. Uh, question from the uh, chat room here. Henry Muto wants to know if there's a football guys draft live on our show this Friday. And uh, I, I'll, I'll tease who's in it uh, at the end of the show. But, yes, we will be doing another live broadcast on the High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour this Friday at 9, 8 Central. We'll be covering a Football Guys Players Championship live with a lot of successful high stakes players. Um, Henry Mudo actually won this league in 2013 when uh, we didn't like his Antonio Brown pick in round five. Ended up panning out for him. Yeah, it was a nice pick. Uh, as sure. well, it was a nice pick. Yeah, is he in absolutely. it this year? He is not. He's not in it this year. But I'll tell you the, the 12 people who are uh, after the broadcast here tonight. Let's move on to the fifth round. Cortland Sutton leading things off as the number two receiver for Brian Pakula. Uh, Cortland Sutton, the wide receiver for Denver, goes at the 501 tonight. Uh, Tyler Lockett right after that to Chris Prince, followed by Raheem Mostert as the third running back selected by the FFPC Joe Todd Hopkins. Michael Nazareth goes with uh, DK Metcalf as his number two receiver to pair with Julio Jones uh, out wide for him. Uh, and that starts a big time receiver run here in the fifth round as well. Keenan Allen to James Boris. Terry McLaurin is the third straight receiver drafted by Darren Armani here at the 506. T.Y. Hilton to St. Pierre and Ashy, followed by Stefan Diggs to Mike Beers. DJ Chark uh, to Sky Eilers as his uh, selection of uh, uh, Chark is his number two receiver. Hunter Henry, a guy, one of your few guys this year, Dave, in my opinion. I, I think you like Hunter Henry. I think that's a safe bet at this point. David Montgomery is the number one running back for Brian Tuminello. And then DeAndre Swift, as Jeff Manns, goes back-to-back running backs uh, in the rookie year uh, for his picks here in the fourth and fifth round, Akers and Swift. Um, is, is this, this just reminds me of something. So uh, in all these dynasty drafts I was in this year, I, I have drafted Jonathan Taylor, J.K. Dobbins, and Clyde Edwards-Alaire. Have not had DeAndre Swift yet. Would it be crazy, or how crazy would it be, or is it not crazy at all, when I have the second pick in a dynasty rookie draft tomorrow to take Swift over Taylor? Just so I have a share of, of each of the big running backs in the draft. I mean, it's fine if you want to do that. Okay, I mean, so it's not not crazy. It's not crazy, but I'm sure the person picking third will be happy. <laughs> because you work out a trade personally, here. I mean, personally, I wouldn't. I wouldn't do it. I would rather you go just, Taylor. Yeah, I would yeah. just go with the guy that I have ranked second. Yeah, which is first. which is Taylor for me. Um, nice little value for uh, Darren Armani here uh, to get Terry McLaurin. This is a guy, and we don't have to talk about him too much because I, I I feel like we've talked about how much of his target share is. Uh, is, is going to go up this year. I guess not much of a value. I feel like he's been going earlier than this. He normally goes at the 508, Dave. He goes at the 506 tonight. Well, interestingly enough, though, they are talking about how Alex Smith is, is going to be ready for training camp, and he may actually be competing with Haskins for that starting job. I don't know. I mean, why don't you know? Alex Smith is a former number one, like, or number whatever he was. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess for Haskins me... Haskins didn't, like, crush it. Did you watch the, um, the, the ESPN special on you know, him rehabilitating this injury. I watched and about two minutes of it. I, I just, I it's, know it's a it's, tough comeback. Yeah, it is. And it's tough for me. And maybe I, I'm, I'm probably in the wrong here. I've been in the wrong plenty of times before, but I see an injury like that. And, and just knowing that, that he is not a guy in his early twenties, he's in his mid thirties now or early thirties, sure. whatever it is. It's tough for me to wrap my head around this guy beating out the hand picked guy. The owner wanted, right. That's a good. Point. Um, so it could happen. I think I would like it uh, better 
if Alex Smith was, was the quarterback. Um, but Haskins, I still think, has the better ceiling there. So it might be better from a redraft perspective. Maybe not the greatest thing for Terry McLaurin long term if he's got to get it, uh, um, adjusted to that. Uh, Shane Hallam chiming in in the chat room. He says he loves Alex Smith, too. Uh, seems to have grit. He doesn't know if he can move around enough at quarterback that's needed to be a starter. Um, but if he's back on the field, I, I guess my whole thing is he'll pass the eye test, Dave, if I see him moving around like he's in his mid-20s again. You know, if I see that, I'm, I'm thinking, well, maybe there is a chance here uh, with Alex Smith throwing uh, the ball to Terry McLaurin and the other Washington receivers. You see they just signed another receiver today. Yeah, well, who did they sign up for? Yesterday or today. Dontrell Inman. Oh, yeah. Now a member of the, the corpse, WFC. The corpse of Dontrell yeah. Inman. Yeah, exactly. Speak, yeah, speaking of Alex Smith, um, Dontrell Inman, uh, now uh, a member of the Washington football team. I am not comfortable, and I think we talked about this, with David Montgomery as my number one uh, running back, Dave. But it does make it a little bit more palatable, palatable the <laughs> for Brian uh, Tuminello uh, that, that he started off with Kelsey, Hill, Smith-Schuster, and Thielen. So it makes it a little bit more enjoyable uh, to have Montgomery as my number one there. I guess you could, you like could do a lot worse. And I like who we took in the, in the sixth round here mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, worked out well, well. given his team construction. Uh, Tuminello, by the way, has won uh, at least one Football Guys League championship in his, uh, in his time with the FFPC. So he definitely knows what's going on there. Uh, no surprise, we saw the big receiver run here coming up. Raheem Mostert, Dave, is the starter for San Francisco. He's going to have to contend with Tevin Coleman. He's going to have to contend with Jarek McKinnon. Um, But the more I I look at his situation, the more I look at where he's going in drafts, uh, I'm I'm really starting to like him uh, as far as a value pick. Normally goes at the 408. He falls to the 503 tonight. I don't know how many passes he's going to catch, but my goodness, Dave, it's fresh in my mind how well he ran the football uh, in the playoffs last year. And I feel like because he doesn't have a lot of mileage on those legs, he's got special team legs and uh, <laughs> he could probably put that to good work. I, I think Raheem Mostert represents a pretty good value at the back end of the fourth round, early part of the fifth. Yeah. I mean, he's an interesting player to look at. Uh, I have never owned him actually. So um, no, that would be, it would be a first if I drafted him this year. You, you could, he doesn't catch passes really much. Uh, I, I don't remember him catching a lot. And, and the reason I know this is because I own him in Blake Harrington dynasty league. So if you want him, Dave, <laughs> we, we could definitely uh, work something out here and you could have Raheem Mostert on your team. Uh, in 2019, he caught 14 passes. Um, he was not the full-time guy all season. Uh, I, I actually, you know what I should look at is his game logs to see what he did down the stretch, because obviously a big part of, of what he did um, was in the playoffs too, which is, is something that, that right. we should remember. Um, he caught one pass against the Chiefs, two against uh, the Packers, zero against Minnesota. So in the playoffs, he only caught three passes. Um, did, did not do much down the stretch as far as catching passes. But again, that's sort of baked into his fourth, fifth round ADP here too, uh, which is the reason that he is slipping. But he had a lot of touches. I mean, he had at least 10 carries every single game from December 1st on. Uh, and, and oftentimes there's over 15 as well, including 29 carries against the Packers. Oh, such a terrible game for <laughs> anybody who is a Packer fan. Wasn't great. Uh, let's move on to the sixth round, which is great because there's a lot of stuff to talk about here. All right. You have uh, Mark Ingram is the third straight running back drafted by Jeff Manns here. Had the opportunity to take any Baltimore running back he wanted. He chose Mark Ingram. Kareem Hunt off the board is the number two running back for Brian Tuminello. like that pick there. Uh, the, the double H's, quadruple H, is uh, Howard Bender at tight end as he goes Hunter Henry in the fifth and Hayden Hurst here in the sixth. Back-to-back tight ends. Uh, the first team to double up on tight ends. How will that affect uh, the rest of the draft, we shall see. Marquise Brown, uh, Hayden Hurst's ex-real-life teammate, uh, goes to Sky Islers right after that at the 604. Evan Engram, uh, the New York Giants tight end, is now a member of Mike Beer's franchise here uh, as he is the 605 tonight. Tyler Boyd, third straight receiver drafted by Peter St. Pierre and Steve Ashey as they have Boyd to go with Calvin Ridley and T.Y. Hilton. 
Darius Geis, number three in the backfield for uh, Darren Armani uh, to go with Dalvin Cook and Austin Eckler. Tyler Higby, the polarizing Tyler Higby <laughs> is uh, that's that's uh, you can't say Tyler Higby anymore. You have to say the word polarizing in front of him because that's what he is. James Boris gets him as his number one tight end. Jarvis Landry and Devontae Parker quickly go off the board after that. That's to Michael Nazarick in the four spot. Devontae Parker to Todd Hopkins here. Uh, in the uh, three spot. Uh, Rob Gronkowski is uh, Chris Prince's backup tight end to Mark Andrews. And then Ronald Jones moving up, moving up, moving up. 6-12 tonight for Brian Pakula as he goes with a Christian McCaffrey, Ronald Jones backfield. That's where we're at on that. And that's where we have uh, to go in the sixth round. So he had four tight ends go off the board here. As I look at um, where these guys normally go, Dave, starting with uh, uh, Evan Ingram tonight went at the um, at the 605. He normally goes at the 603. No surprise there. Higby 609 tonight 608. Uh, Hunter Henry and Hayden Hurst actually have been going at the beginning of the seventh round. Dave, they go in the early sixth. Well, uh, in the fifth and then the uh, the early sixth tonight uh, by Howard Bender again, just going out and getting his guys. You have uh, talked about the importance of not going early quarterback and er, and early tight end. Um, what's your philosophy on not necessarily going tight end, tight end uh, to start a draft, but getting a couple of the mid-tier guys back-to-back like Howard Bender did here in the fifth and sixth round? Is that a strategy that we, you would employ in a tight end premium draft? Well, if, I was, if I was really a big fan of those of the players I was getting, I, I think I could do that. I generally probably wouldn't. I would probably be more apt to draft. Like there in his case, I would have drafted Henry, and then probably if I drafted Henry, not a, not a running back like Chris right. Hunt or something, yep. I probably would have looked at a receiver like Tyler Boyd. I thought that was actually a nice pick in the by Peter St. Pierre shortly thereafter. The four tight ends that went off the board in the sixth round, Hurst Ingram, Tyler Higby, and Rob Gronkowski. Shane Hallam chiming in in the blog talk radio chat room saying he thinks he likes uh, Hayden Hurst the most. He, it says it's risky. It's a risky pick, but the upside is huge. Is Hurst your favorite tight end of those four as well, Dave, yes. given where they went, Gronk, Higby, Engram, and, and Hurst there? Yeah, and he, he did go first, of course. But, yeah, that, just playing in that offense, it, it is so tight end friendly. And uh, the other guys are going to command too much attention. Julio and Ridley are going to command so much attention. You have a Pro Bowl caliber quarterback. I didn't realize it. Well, I mean, I knew Hayden Hurst was kind of old for a, a tight end coming into the league. Yeah. Um, and I guess when I hear that, I just assume Mormon mission. You know, like that's just the first thing that, that comes to mind. He was actually a minor league baseball player. Yep. And uh, I think he was a pitcher and just for whatever reason, just could not find the strike zone anymore. So he decided to give football a crack and now look at him. Yeah. He's, well, he's, I mean, he still hasn't done jack crap in the NFL. But well, I mean, but, getting paid. but to but to be in the NFL for what is this, his third year? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, that is an accomplishment given his his earlier career choice and then given how far he was behind the curve to some of these other players. Uh, I think he's doing uh, well, but you're right. He's yeah, yeah, he had to work. I'm sure he had to work really hard coming from baseball, getting back into football shape, football size, speed, you know, agility, just doing all that stuff. Uh, so, yeah, kudos to him to, to be where, you know, he got he was a first round pick. So that, that was impressive in and of itself. I'm going to ask you about Jarvis Landry here. I'm just kind of looking up his injury uh, that he had. Um, he is on the active pup list. He had hip surgery. Jake Trotter, who I believe covers the Browns for ESPN, says that he's expected to return from this hip surgery on time. He had it back in February. Last year, 83 catches, almost 1,200 yards, um, five and a half targets per game in eight games with Cleveland last year. Are you concerned about this hip surgery, Dave, given that? So, hang on. Say that again. So, he had. 1,200 yards on the 1,100, 1,100, no, 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 excuse me. So he had 83 catches for 1,174 yards. He Last had year. five, yes, five and a half targets per game in eight games. So what does that eight, even mean? In eight games, he averaged at least five and a half targets a game. Oh, okay. So he played all 16 games, but eight of those games, he had five and a half or more targets. I'm going to look, yes, I'm going to look at the game log Sorry, right now just, just to verify this. Was, I didn't, it didn't compute. It made it seem like he only played eight games, but somehow. He played all 16. Okay. Uh, all 16 last year. Yeah, actually, he came on at the end. Well, I guess he the he was pretty steady, Eddie, uh, for the entire season. But, okay, so knowing that he put up these numbers and knowing that, you know, you could get him in tonight's draft at the 609, Dave, would you, are you okay with that, given the hip surgery that happened six months ago? Uh, I don't think so, actually. I think that 
you know, Landry's never been a speed player. So I, I guess I have, I do have concerns about him coming back from that, from hip surgery and the fact that he's on the active pup list six months after the surgery. Uh, you know, I mean, it could be just you know, being super precautionary. I mean, if they say, if they say he's back and looking good, I, I think then I'd, I'd be more apt to draft him, but he was never, a, I know that speed's never been his game, but if he loses, you know, anything off of his 40 time, that you know, makes it even worse. Is, yeah. he, is he going to be able to separate, I guess, is, and get open? Still? Yeah. Just change a direction from, from a, from a, from hip surgery, I think is the biggest thing for me is getting open and, and then making guys miss certainly won't be an easy thing for Jarvis Landry to do if he is not fully healthy. Uh, he will at least have the advantage of being closer to being in football shape uh, because of the weird off season. So it's, it's not like he's going to be behind the curve relative to the other receivers in Cleveland. Moving on to the seventh round here, uh, Brandon Cook's kicking things off here for Brian Pakula at the 701, J.K. Dobbins, another rookie running back, and uh, Chris Prince makes him his third rusher here at the 702. Uh, Devin Singletary, the number four running back drafted by Todd Hopkins here at the 703. Jared Cook is backing up Zach Ertz for Michael Nazarick and the FF Mastermind squad here in the four slot. Marlon Mack to James Boris as his number three running back. Dak Prescott is once again the third quarterback off the board. Falls to the seventh round tonight. Darren Armani gets him here at the 706. Noah Fant off the board to Peter St. Pierre and Steve Ashey here at the 707 tonight. And if I'm counting correctly, I believe that makes Fant the number 12 uh, tight end. So I guess that is about on par with um, the the normal order he goes. Will Fuller, my guy, to Mike Beers from <laughs> Rotoviz uh, here at the 708. Kyler Murray is the fourth quarterback chosen. And the number one quarterback for Sky Eilers here, uh, taking Kyler Murray at the 709. Jordan Howard is the third running back selected by Howard Bender. And then you have Deontay Johnson and A.J. Green wrapping up the seventh round. Deontay Johnson to uh, to Manello and then A.J. Green to Jeff Manns. Dave, this is a best ball slim format. Set it and forget it. Uh, And to Manello now has the top two receivers in Pittsburgh. I would never consider Pittsburgh as an elite passing team, uh, but they do get Ben Roethlisberger back. Uh, you would think that he's going to be much more capable than Mason Rudolph and the other guys that they were trotting out there last year. Can you get on board in a format like this with a Juju Smith-Schuster, Deontay Johnson stack? If I like Deontay Johnson, I could, sure, yeah. I'm like a, We talked about last night, I'm not a huge fan of him, so uh, I'd be going a different, different direction. But, uh, yeah, I could get on board with that. The, you know, the news came out today, it was kind of newsworthy, that uh, Big Ben's coming back from an injury that, he thinks no one has ever come back from before. And he's 38 too. So Roethlisberger said this. Yeah. Oh my God. Really? Yeah. (laughs) I don't know if that instills any confidence in me. Yeah. It's it's kind of give you a little bit of pause at least, you know, when you think about it, it's like, okay, he's coming back. And then what if he fails or what if he doesn't, you know, what if he's just totally not able to do it? Well then Juju and Deontay Johnson are probably going to suffer because of it. You think he's trying to motivate himself to the media? I mean, is there any possibility there with Ben Roethlisberger? I don't know. I don't know what Ben Roethlisberger capable, is capable of. But, I mean, just say, like, you know, nobody's ever come back from – or I don't believe anybody's ever come back from this uh, before. So, I don't know if he's challenging himself to, to work hard and be the first guy. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, he says he feels young. Uh, he says he still wants to win Lombardi's. And he says that the injury, as he described it, involved tears of three of the five flexor tendons in his elbow, and he believes he was the first quarterback to attempt to come back from such an ailment. He's thinner and lighter, which uh, I don't know. I don't know how thin and light he could be. Yeah. <laughs> thin, and, thin and light for him is like 250, 255. Yeah. Um, I, I saw that, you know, this is probably like a month, month and a half ago. Uh, maybe it's like two months ago now because we're in August. But um, there was the video of him sort of throwing, um, and he wasn't at throwing at 100% effort or 100% speed and it, it didn't look it didn't look natural it didn't look good he looked like again like a 60 year old quarterback that's just wow. tossing the to- but he was on purpose not going full bore oh, but yeah. he had the long hair and the long beard and he said he wasn't going to shave either one cut either one until he was throwing regular speed NFL passes to his teammates and then they the Steelers put out an Instagram video of him whistling these out patterns to Johnson and Smith Schuster and everything. And then the very next thing was him shaving off his beard and getting a haircut. And he did look good. He looked much better uh, than that. But I think you're right to, to have some trepidation with uh, uh, the Steelers receivers this year. You kind of got to look what who's going around him and, and does the, does the uh, ceiling um, 
match up with the risk that you're taking there? And that's a question that everybody will have to answer. Obviously, we've seen how Brian Tuminello has answered that question with Smith Schuster in the third and then Deontay Johnson in the seventh. I am a big Matt Breida guy. I, I like Matt Breida. Uh, I think that he is going to be catching a lot of passes for Miami this year. And the reason I, well, one of the reasons I like him too, maybe more than others, is I don't like Jordan Howard, Dave. I am not a fan. I know he's the starter. I know he's going to get the most carries there as long as he stays healthy for Miami. Uh, but I just look at you know Jordan Howard and, and Matt Breida tonight goes to Peter St. Pierre and Steve Ashey here in the eighth. We'll get to that in a second. But when Jordan Howard's up there, uh, in the seventh round, I'm totally passing on him every time. And, and maybe if Brita makes it to me, I'll take him. But I just, I can't get on board with Jordan Harder. I've been burned by that guy too much when I try to draft him as a third or fourth running back. It just almost never pans out. Well, then you have to contend with Miami, which has one of the worst offensive lines in football. So, and Brita has to deal with that less just because he's going to be the pass catching back. But, you know, if you, if you think two is going to be out there too, I mean, and I think he, I actually think he will be out there. I think that bodes well for Brita. Uh, yeah, Shane Hallam also chiming in saying Breida better than Howard. Give me the guy who catches passes. And I, I feel like that's been a theme for a lot of high-stakes drafters over the year. Yeah, uh, there's a reason not to take Mostert. Yeah, well, I, then, <laughs> well but who's going to be – who's the pass catcher for San Francisco? Used uh, to be Breida. Kittle. <laughs> yeah, Kittle, exactly. <laughs> we'll line him up at the H back there, uh, certainly. Um, I, I don't – okay, so – a lot of this stuff I, I know I've said before. Here's a question I don't think I've asked you through all the pros versus Joes. Who do you like better this year, uh, given that they are going pretty close to each other between Dak Prescott and Kyler Murray, if you're going to take one of those guys? Is it Murray because he's more of a threat with his legs? Hmm. I think I would take Prescott. I just feel a little bit safer with him. Because of the weapons and and uh, the fact that he, yeah, he's done he it like, longer. Yeah, he's done it. Like, yeah, he's more experienced, done it longer. Add C. D. Lamb. Uh, so I just feel a little bit more comfortable with Dak Prescott. Moving on into the eighth round here, after A. J. Green goes to Jeff Manns of the seven twelve, he doubles that up with Zach Moss. Zach Moss, the backup or potentially starting running back for Buffalo, depending upon where you fall in on that conversation. Dallas Goddard is going to be backing up Travis Kelsey for Brian Tuminello here as he takes him at the 8.02. Deshaun Watson, fifth quarterback off the board to Howard Bender tonight, followed by Mike Jasicki to Sky Eilers. Then you have Russell Wilson uh, going to Mike Beers tonight as a sixth quarterback going off the board. Wow, that seems pretty good to get Russell Wilson as the sixth quarterback. I like that quite a bit. Uh, Matt Breedas to St. Pierre and uh, Ashy right after that. Michael Gallup, the number four receiver drafted by Darren Armani, followed by Kerryon uh, Johnson, the second Johnson running back to James Boris, as he has the Johnson and Johnson backfield with David and Kerryon, also going uh, with Leonard Fournette and Marlon Mack there too. Uh, Matt Ryan's the first quarterback drafted by Michael Nazarek here at the 809, followed by Janu Smith to Todd Hopkins as his starting tight end. Devo Samuel uh, won't be in action uh, too soon with, uh, with his injury, but eventually he will be, and he is the number three receiver for Chris Prince. Austin Hooper is the final pick of the eighth round, backing up Darren Waller at tight end for Brian Pakula. This probably is a question, Dave, that um, will depend on if you went with an elite tight end, but when do you think is the right time to have two tight ends? in a best ball slim format like this? When, when, when do you want to make sure you have two tight ends? And I guess maybe the, the better way to phrase it is not necessarily a round, but do you, you want to have two of the top blank tight ends in, in this? Is it, is it top 15? Is it top 20? Um, I think it does matter a bit if you did take one of the elite guys. And, and I would classify Andrews and Ertz as elite. In, that, in that elite status. Yeah. I mean, you know, again, they're the second tier behind Kelsey and Kittle. Um, I, I, probably two of the top 15 or 17. I, I want to be one of the first four or five people to take a second tight end. Yeah, I think so. I think that's the way I would, I would treat it as well. It just makes, I mean, again, if you're not getting one of the big four, uh, I think that's the way to do it. Um, I, are you worried about Zach Moss if you own Devin Singletary this year? I'm not really worried about him, although I, I think that Zach Moss is definitely a standalone value, and I think that he he's a pretty solid pick. Um, Mike, no. I, I thought that, by the way, Singletary, it seems like that he, 703, that seems really late for him. So I thought that was – when you look at the difference between taking Devin Singletary at 703 and Marlon Mack, whose job is like, you know, mm-hmm. you know on you know life support, <laughs> right. two picks later, um, it's a really nice value for Singletary there. Um 
you know what's interesting is uh um you know think think about an office space meeting and, and the bobs bring in the backfield for the indianapolis colts and they talk to jonathan taylor well what do you do around here well, I'm the lead dog. I can catch passes. I can pick up blitzes. The team drafted me in the early second round. I'm the future in this backfield. And they turned into Heem Hines. Well, what do you do here? Well, I'm the pass catcher. You know, I'm going to come in on third down. Philip Rivers is going to use me as his safety valve. I'm going to catch you, you know, 40, 50, maybe even 60 passes this year. And they turn to Marlon Mack. Well, what do you do, Marlon? Well, I basically do what those two guys do, but at about a 50% efficiency rate. <laughs> and that's it. And then he is jettisoned. Uh, maybe not off the team, but definitely uh, relegated to the bench and, until there is, um, you know, an opportunity that presents itself uh, because of an injury or something like that. But it's, it's hard to get excited for Mac. Yeah, I, I agree. It's funny though, Marlon Mack. I mean, he was very productive, you know, last year and the year before, year before when he was healthy. I thought um, I thought he was actually pretty solid. But he was never a pedigree back, right? And the team never looked at him as an elite back. And that that's like. I think when you look at Aaron Jones, the people still have that trepidation with Aaron Jones. And I think that's why he goes with the late second. Um, it's for some, amongst other reasons. Maybe. If you are not a believer in Marlon Mack, and if, and if you see what he did last year as far as stats go, you got to be super excited about what a pedigree guy like Jonathan Taylor could do behind that offensive line, though. Yeah, for sure. If he gets the opportunity, at like um, I think he might, actually. I really do think. I, I know we've talked about kind of leaving rookie running backs alone. But at a certain point, you know, you have to realize that they, they, they might get their opportunity. But in an 11-game, like, main event type season, they may not get it in time for you to do well. And so, and Taylor is not – he's not cheap. I mean, at least, you know, Dobbins goes in the seventh round here, you know, so that's, that's pretty inexpensive. You know, Taylor is a third-round pick. Taylor went at the uh, 309 tonight. Uh, on average, he has been going uh, in, in these FFPC best ball slims at the 310. So he was right on brand tonight uh, for that selection. I wanted to bring this up back in the fifth round, and it slipped my mind because we got talking about something else. Um, but in the fifth round, you saw Tyler Lockett uh, go to Chris Prince at the 502. Two picks later, Michael Nazarick took DK Metcalf. I don't think we've seen Lockett go ahead of Metcalf uh, in any of these pros versus Joes so far, but it happened tonight. The question I have for you, Dave, when you're talking about drafting one of those Seattle Seahawks receivers in the fifth round, do you, uh, do you have any pause uh, about making that selection, knowing that the Seahawks continued to be mentioned in the same breath as being interested in Antonio Brown? And also hoping Josh Gordon is back this year too. Yeah, you know that's that's something to think about. It really is. Um, but you know Antonio Brown's out for eight games that to start, right? I mean, mm-hmm. isn't that established for correct? And he says he's not. Uh, I, the report I read said that he is not appealing either. So it will be an eight game suspension. Yeah. So I mean, it, it uh, you know if he, if that actually happened and he did come back, he would for sure probably cut into the production of both of those players. I, I think that is true. You know who I like then, if that's the case. Russell Wilson, because, yeah. because, you know, yeah. I, I can't remember who said this is an analyst on Twitter said, here's the Seattle offense. The last couple of years, pound it unsuccessfully and inefficiently for three quarters. And then let Russell Wilson go wild in the fourth quarter. Yeah, and he it, has to, cause he has to, and, and he has the skills to, and you know, I, I, I don't think Josh Gordon is anything to, to write home about at this point anymore. Um, you know, even when he was healthy, he was not all that effective. Um, when he, you know, came back off of whatever suspension it was, whatever number suspension it was, uh, Antonio Brown, I think, uh, there's some juice left there and there could be, that could hurt the, the value of, of both Lockett and Metcalf if he's there, but Russell Wilson certainly would get a bump up my rankings, uh, for show. Uh, as the kids say, have we uh, mentioned Johnu Smith at all this year? I, I, I think that you, maybe we have, because I feel like you don't like him this year, the starting tight end for the Tennessee Titans in uh, a non-explosive pass offense. You know, I would, I would look at him. I mean, people, people do like him. Uh, I just, I really haven't drafted him. I think it's because I was on him his second year and he was terrible. So it's, it's tough for me to get back on board. There was uh, not his first year as a starter. But when he was still backing up Delaney Walker, um, I had Delaney Walker in a league, in a uh, Kentucky league, actually. And he was declared out, you know, like a concussion or something. You know, Delaney Walker was just so dinged up his last mm-hmm. couple of years in yep. the league. And I needed a tight end desperately. John o. Smith was out on the waiver wire. Um, I didn't have much cash left in my blind bidding. I got him. Mm-hmm. So were, super excited. Yep. Stoke. I'm like, this is great. I have a legit tight end one that I can play this week. And Dave, I think he had one target 
Yeah, zero. You that scored was a it. zero, right? Scored a zero. I know. I've started him more than once, and he's gotten to nothing. And that has – I have penalized Jonu Smith in my fantasy evaluation of him ever since. I can no longer talk unbiasedly about Jonu Smith. And I, you know, Just and cannot you know do that's, it. That's our own fault. That's our problem. I mean, really, we should, be, we should be able to let that go. And I can't. <laughs> you know, it's, it's the same people – okay, so, so I've heard this before. The, the people who say, I will never draft X player again after this. And I think that's a mistake. I, I, okay, initially I thought that was a mistake. I'm like, you know, you, you got to put your emotions to the side, you know, and, and, and make sure um, that, that you are – it's the same thing with um, the whole Ray Rice and Adrian Peterson thing when, when they were, you know, suspended right. or whatever. You don't and pe- people character. took a moral stance that yeah, they, right. they, I will never own that guy. And I was always of the opinion like, well, okay, that's fine, and I respect that. It's your team. Do what you want to do. But there are going to be other players that take him, that will use him against you, and they, they might end up costing you a fantasy uh, win um, because you, you followed your heart uh, instead of, you, you know, your mind or whatever. But then I was thinking about this, and I'm like, I don't think that's a mistake anymore. I think you should draft the players that you want to root for, draft the players that makes fantasy football fun, and if you don't want to root for those players, don't draft them. It's your team. It's not anybody else's team. You do you, and, and I think that is how I, I've changed my stance hey, on that. You know that. what, that's, uh, that's fine. I can live with that. All right, so get on to the uh, ninth round here, Dave, as we are approaching the halfway point of Pros versus Joe's Macho Man League number six. Drafters. Yeah, I kept going to say the pick same it up, thing you here. Losers. <laughs> how the hell hard is it to pick a player? <laughs> Christian Kirk is the first guy off the board here at the 901 to Brian Pakula. Uh, a couple of tight ends then. TJ Hawkinson to Chris Prince and Jack Doyle to Todd Hopkins. Philip Lindsay, my number one running back in so many of my drafts. I got to stop looking at my early <laughs> drafts. Just so speaking of frustrating things, Philip Lindsay at the 904 tonight. Julian Edelman to James Boris. Uh, and then you have Blake Jarwin starting at tight end. For Darren Armani, uh, Emmanuel Sanders is going to be the number four uh, wide receiver for Peter St. Pierre and Steve Ashey in the seventh slot tonight. Uh, Marvin Jones off the board is the number four receiver for Mike Beers, the 2017 Pros versus Joes champion. James White, pass catching running back. He's going to be the number four running back for Sky Eilers, followed by Darius Slayton uh, to Howard Bender here at the 9-10. Alexander Madison off the board to 9-11 Brian Tuminello. And then Mike Williams, Jeff Manns, 9-12. And that is how the ninth round finishes here tonight. My favorite tight end in this round? No, it's not TJ Hawkinson, Dave. It's actually Jack Doyle. I think he's being underrated. I know he gets hurt a lot, but I feel like in that Indianapolis offense with Phillip Rivers, who's really targeted the tight end uh, over the course of his career, and granted, he's had some pretty good tight ends to throw to, and Hunter Henry, Antonio Gates, so on and so forth. But I think Jack Doyle's being underrated. I really like him this year where he's going. Yeah, it's an interesting point when you talk about Rivers and throwing the tight ends all the time with his kind of weird, you know, weird. Pop gun. Yeah. Yeah. What are they? We have pop gun. What are they? Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's what it looks like. You know, yeah, it's yeah. just that's interesting delivery. Let's just he, say that. He's just, he's never, he, I don't want to say he throws like a girl, but you know, I'm, I'm trying to teach my, not in this day and age. Yeah. I'm trying to teach my, uh, my son to throw with his full arm with the wind up, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and Philip Rivers, I don't think his dad ever taught him that because he just he flicks his wrist and, and it, the ball sails. Um, Shane Hallam making an interesting point tonight. He thinks Trey Burton is actually going to be better than Jack Doyle. Remember, Trey Burton is back with Frank Reich uh, in Indianapolis this year, and I actually did make my final, I think it was my final pick of the Scott Fishbowl, was Trey Burton as my number three or four tight end. So there might be something there too, and I believe he did go – in one of the pros versus Joe's in the final round, if I remember correctly. Hmm. Um, I, think, I think it was this week. It was either Sunday or Monday night. Somebody took Trey Burton uh, with the last pick of the round. But I, I still like Doyle. I know uh, Shane is, is going to hammer, hammer me with his Hallam hammer over that, but I'm, I'm, that, that's the way I feel uh, right now. Certainly Burton with uh, the value that you can get on him um, is, uh, is very attractive there. Uh, nobody else I don't... Oh, okay. Uh, one other player I wanted to talk about. Alexander Madison here, Dave. He has slipped ever since Dalvin Cook uh, reported to training camp for the Minnesota Vikings, knowing that there will be no holdout there. Uh, is there any kind of value to you in taking Alexander Madison in the ninth round if you don't have Dalvin Cook? I mean, is, is that a particularly attractive pick? I'm framing this in a way for you to say, no, that's a bad pick. <laughs> uh, no, I... I... I think it's, it's it's an okay pick. I I, I probably gone a little bit. I would I probably looked at Latavius Murray 
or Tariq Cohen because they both have standalone value. Uh, not that Madison doesn't, but it's less. I mean, Cook really is, does command the ball. By the way, Shane Hallam was the guy who took Jay Burton in the last round oh. of the Browns draft. <laughs> that's, uh, that's really funny. I like how he's like, you know, sub touting himself, which mm-hmm. you know, which is which is. I know that sounds like a bad thing. That's a great thing. That's I love fun. it. Um, yeah, but who was the genius who did that? Oh wait, it was me. That was me. Um, here's the thing with Madison for me. It's like you remember when when uh, Dalvin Cook got hurt, um, and we were talking about well, who who's who's the guy going to be? You know, Mike Boone got a lot of run too. And if I'm remembering correctly, I believe both those guys were healthy. Um, and, and Mike Boone was getting a lot of run. Uh, and then they had somebody else take center stage um, coming back after the, um, uh, after the, um, uh, you know, the, re- you know, the, the return of Madison or whatever. And then they had somebody else. If I'm rem- again, if I'm remembering correctly, it was just a mess in that backfield. So that's another reason I'm kind of off of Madison. Uh, it's just that there doesn't, I don't think he's going to be the guy if, uh, if cook were to go down, uh, let's get into the 10th round and talk about the guys that were selected there. Daryl Henderson kicking things off at the 10 one, Nicole Hardman, followed by Sony Michelle, uh, Hardman uh, at, at the uh, 1002, uh, Sony Michelle at the 1003. Pair of Georgia Bulldogs, if I'm remembering correctly. Nicole Hardman go to Georgia? You, I'm asking the wrong guy. You wouldn't know. Yeah, I don't know. Shane, get on that. Just because uh, it's Hardman, I don't remember. Right. Yeah, I can't remember. I thought it was Georgia. Maybe it wasn't. Uh, CD Lamb off the board after that to Sky Eilers uh, at the uh, 1004 tonight, followed by Tariq Cohen to Mike Beers. He gets him as his number four running back. Carson Wentz will be the starting signal caller for Peter St. Pierre and Steve Ashey. That's the Doughboys, right? Peter St. Pierre is Doughboys? Oh, uh, yep. All right. Shane Hallam confirmed both went to Georgia. Not the Doughboys, but Hardman and Michelle. Uh, Chris Herndon, back-to-back tight end selections here for Darren Armani. Uh, Blake Jarwin in the ninth, and now Chris Herndon in the tenth. A couple of upside guys there. Latavius Murray off the board to James Boris. One pick away from Michael Nazareth. Not sure if he would have taken Latavius Murray here in the 10th had he had the opportunity, but he takes Jameson Crowder instead. Tony Pollard uh, to Todd Hopkins as he matches up Ezekiel Elliott and Tony Pollard together. Tevin Coleman to Chris Prince uh, as his number four running back, followed by the rookie speedster out of Alabama, Henry Ruggs to Brian Pakula. I know Ruggs was the first receiver drafted this year, Dave, in a very deep wide receiver class. Um, I'm, uh, I, I know he is a, a speed guy. Is he more than a speed guy to you? Uh, do you think that he has the chops to be a number one receiver in the NFL with, with Derek Carr or Mariota or somebody throwing to him for Las Vegas? Well, he has a chance to be. I mean, I think that, you know, if you're an optimist, if you have rose colored glasses, you think maybe he's the next Tyree kill because he has that speed. He has a speed that just is unmatched by anyone else in this draft class. And even every couple of years, he's like a once every few years type speedster. Um, he wasn't, you know, he was less productive than his teammates. So that, that's the question that uh, needs to be asked. It's not, a, I don't think it's a bad pick in best ball formats because, he, you know, even if he's just, a, you know, catching bombs every once in a while, I mean, even if, you know, he catches, you know, four 80 yard touchdowns over the course of the season, he's probably going to start for you four times then. So he's not, he's not a bad pick though. Do you have Alvin Kamara and you take him with the third or fourth pick, uh, fifth pick, whatever? Is Latavius Murray a must for you if you can get him in the ninth or tenth? I wouldn't say he's a must. No, he's kind of a nice to have type thing. Ah, okay, all right, got it. Uh, I have. What do you think? <laughs> okay, I'm gonna do the American thing here, Dave, and say one thing and do the exact opposite. I have drafted Alvin Kamara in so many leagues this year. I've gotten Latavius Murray in one of them, and and I don't think it's I don't think it's a Kamara team of mine. Like I, I think <laughs> I just drafted him, uh, which is so bizarre. I actually um. Uh, I, I was really shocked at because normally I'm pretty vigilant about stuff like that in hooking, you know, getting a hookup. And it's not, I look back at these draft boards. They, they weren't like overdrafted. Murray was not over. I should have gotten them in more leagues and I didn't. So, and I, now I might pay the price if Camara goes down because Latavius Murray looked really good a couple of weeks uh, when Camara missed uh, last year, certainly something to be concerned about if you miss out on Latavius Murray uh, when you own Alvin Camara. We talked about Tariq Cohen. There's no reason to uh, discuss him anymore. We have talked about um, the Jets, Dave, uh, uh, passing game, talking about 
Is it Prashad Perriman? Is he going to be the number one receiver? Uh, can Denzel Mims make a dent and become the number one guy right away? One of the guys that we have not talked about um, is a player who just got taken in this round here, the 10th round. Jamison Crowder, uh, who has caught a lot of passes over the year. In fact, he's really endeared himself to PPR fantasy players, given how many catches he can get. Maybe the obvious choice here uh, for the Jets' number one receiver, the yeah, guy we don't really think traditionally as a number one receiver, could be Crowder. Yeah, he's a slot guy, but he, he commanded a lot of targets last year. He's, he's a pretty good playmaker. I, I like him. Take a guess at how many targets he had last year in playing 16 games, starting 12 of them. Played 16, started 12, 110. He had 122 targets. Good guess. That's a lot. 122 targets, 78 catches for 833 yards, and six touchdowns last year. That's pretty solid. What was he like, wide receiver 28 or 30 probably? Now you're asking me a question I can't find. Sorry about that. That's all right. Yeah, that's that's what he was. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. Dead on, Dave. Got it exactly right. <laughs> He's being drafted as wide receiver 41 uh, on average at the 10-12. Tonight he goes uh, at the uh, at the 10-09. So, again, very close to his normal ADP. That seems like a nice little value there. If you can get him as your number four receiver, I think you're doing it right, as the kids say. Totally agree. Totally agree. Moving on to the 11th round here, ladies and gentlemen, as uh, – yeah, we're two picks away from completing the 11th round. I'll get to it here. Kishan Vaughn leading things off for Brian uh, Pakula here, the FFPC Joe in the number one spot. He goes Keyshawn Vaughn, followed by Anthony Miller, another receiver I really like this year. Tom Brady falls to the 11th round, and he is the number one quarterback for Todd Hopkins. Boy, you wait 10 rounds, and then in the 11th round, you end up taking – a guy who has six rings, multiple MVP awards, Dave, and he's throwing to Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, and Rob Gronkowski. That's got to fe- make you feel Howard. And O.J. Howard and yeah. Cameron Brait. That's got to make you feel warm and fuzzy. Nice job, Todd, Todd Hopkins there. Uh, Duke Johnson off the board to Michael Nazarick. Uh, one pick away from James Boris, which would have been his third Johnson running back. So it would have been the Johnson, Johnson, and Johnson wishbone <laughs> backfield. Too bad, so sad. Sterling Shepard is who Boris settles for instead as his number four receiver. Boston Scott to Darren Armani right after that. And then a trio of tight ends. Jay Sternberger to St. Pierre and Ashy. Uh, Ian Thomas to Mike Beers, followed by Irv Smith to Sky Eilers. That is uh, the number two tight end for each one of those teams, as each of them now has two tight ends. You have Josh Allen going off the board to Howard Bender, as he has uh, two quarterbacks now, Allen to Deshaun Watson, and then A.J. Dillon off the board to um, uh, Brian uh, Tuminello as the penultimate pick of the 11th round. And then wrapping things up here is Jalen Rager in the 11th to Jeff Manns. Jeff Manns going a little rookie crazy here, Dave. Um, Well, we, we can talk about his 12th pick here with Michael Pittman, but you look at his draft so far, he has five rookies on his team, certainly going all upside here. And, you know, we talked about avoiding rookies in general. Mans is going the complete opposite direction. Is there, is there something to be said for that, given what we have said, um, you know, with this truncated offseason? Is there value in zagging hard when everybody else is zigging? I personally think it's a recipe for disaster. So I think no. Yeah. There's okay. some, that's, there is something to be said, and that, that's my opinion. <laughs> when you when you have that much of your team be rookies, it's like you're you're just piling risk upon risk upon risk. Now, if they're all great, great. Uh, and if, and they don't all have to be great, but they uh, they have to do something. So I don't know. I just don't. I don't. I don't see. I thought it was. I thought it was kind of interesting that he took Acres Swift, and then instead of taking Dobbins, he took Ingram. So I thought you know he's clearly not just taking rookies out of spite or anything. Like right. Yeah. So. Uh, he, he likes all those players, so you know, good on him. And if they if they pan out, I'm sure some will. But um, when you have that many, and, and generally rookies don't, you know, not that they don't produce. I mean, but some do, some don't. A lot of times they don't. They are so hit or miss, obviously. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, and and that's that's the mystery box. It all depends on how risky you want to be. Mans is going full on risk tonight. Uh, we'll see what happens there going forward. Uh, how much, if any, standalone value does A.J. Dillon have? Scale of 1 to 10, are you going to put it at like 2? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I, it's interesting. We, he has to be out Jamal Williams, Yep. which he's likely to do. Um, yep. He might get some goal line action, possibly. I mean, there's a chance he – I don't know. I mean, I guess he could technically take that role. The team drafted him early. Some, maybe a 4. 
I, I've heard scuttlebutt, and I don't necessarily believe this, but there's a chance hey, Jamal. You're the local guy. Yeah, I know. You tell me. I, this, well, this is what I'm hearing, and I don't know if this is not. And I'm not. And when I say this is what I'm hearing, I'm not well connected. I'm barely connected. I'm, I'm like uh, the sh- the shredded ACL. I'm like the MCL that's just hanging by a thread. Um, that's how connected I am. Um, Jamal Williams could be cut before the the season starts, and they go with the backfield of um, um, Aaron Jones. Uh, A.J. Dillon, and then uh, Tyler Irvin, who would double as a return specialist as well. Um, Shane Hallam says he's with you, four for A.J. Dillon in best ball as far as. All right, I'm glad know, we agree. Uh, he'll get a few multi-touchdown games and get best ball value. I uh, I think that, I don't know, I, I, I've been down on Aaron <laughs> Jones's knees for, for a while, and now I feel like this is the year that I've invested more in, in him than I ever have before. And I, I think this is the year he lets me down and I've gotten sniped on AJ Dillon a, a few times too. When I was one pick away from drafting him, I just, it's not shaping up good for me. Duke Johnson <laughs> is going to be the uh, backfield running mate for David Johnson. Duke Johnson goes to Michael Nazareth here in the 11th round. Now he's got some standalone value, Dave, and certainly uh, maybe of a higher ceiling if David Johnson can't stay healthy or, uh, if he just doesn't have it anymore. Duke Johnson could be a huge beneficiary and could make a lot of best ball people happy, especially when they're getting him in the 11th round. Yeah, that's a good point. I've, you know, kind of uh, my thing with Duke Johnson is David Johnson is such a good pass catching back, but maybe, like you said, maybe he's just aged and isn't, I mean, why was he so bad in, in Arizona last year? I mean, that's part of the question that you have to ask about right. David Johnson. Uh, so, yeah, I think Duke Johnson is a fine pick in the 11th. Um, with the signing of LaShawn McCoy, did that slam the door on you investing in any Keyshawn Vaughn at all this year? I know you're kind of down on him to begin with, but it seems like he's been dropping in drafts and Jones has been going higher. Uh, you know, I think that I thought he was a good pick because that owner has Ronald Jones. So, you know, since Brian took Rojo, uh, it works. It, you know, I think it's, I think it's okay. I don't, yeah, I know what you're saying about just taking him on his own. Right. Yeah, I, I think I'd be down, down him maybe another round further down. I think for me, it's just I, I would move on. It, and I don't think McCoy is going to do anything but hurt the fantasy value of Jones and Vaughn. You know, he's going to be that classic guy. Why are you doing this? He's, he's, he doesn't have the same upside as, as the rookie third rounder, as, as, as your former rookie second, uh, former second round pick in, in Ronald Jones. I just, he doesn't have the juice anymore. Once again, I, I, I don't think McCoy makes a huge impact on Ronald Jones. That's my opinion. Okay, all right. Uh, I stated yesterday. Yes, you did. <laughs> Moving on. Michael Pittman, uh, I already said, to Jeff Manns at the 1201. Big Ben Roethlisberger. So Tuminello does what, what we talked about earlier. He gets Smith-Schuster, he gets Deontay Johnson, and now he gets Ben Roethlisberger. All he needs now is Hein Wards to complete the force. Uh, <laughs> there, Curtis Samuel off the board at 1203 to Howard Bender. Preston Williams to Sky Eilers right after that is his number five wide up. This is the quarterback round as Seven of them go off the board. Matthew Stafford, uh, the suddenly COVID-free Matthew Stafford to Mike Beers. Drew Brees right after that. Drew Brees was like the number five or six quarterback drafted <laughs> last night, Dave. Yeah, he was. And how the mighty have fallen. So all of a sudden, everybody realized he's 42 years old or 41 or whatever it is. Chase Edmonds uh, goes to Darren Armani. Chase Edmonds is uh, the second half of a pair of interesting picks there by Darren Armani in the 11th and as he gets some two high upside handcuff guys in uh, Scott and Edmonds and maybe some standalone value with Boston Scott as well. Aaron Rodgers to James Boris to back up Patrick Mahomes, Daniel Jones to Michael Nazarick to back up Matt Ryan, Baker Mayfield to back up Todd Hopkins, and then Cam Newton to Chris Prince in the 12th as his starting quarterback, the former MVP, goes to Beer Makers fan here with the penultimate pick of the 12th round, Last pick being another rookie as Pakula goes back to back with rookies here to Sean Vaughn and then fellow rookie running back Antonio Gibson. Stafford's underrated, Dave. I said it last year. I'm saying it again this year. I like his ta- I like his uh, weapons. Uh, he's a former number one overall pick, and that Lions defense is how you say no bueno. And it, they didn't do much better. They didn't do much in in the off season to improve it. I know they got Jeffrey Okuda uh, to sort of take over the Darius Slay role, but he is a rookie. And he's a rookie corner. Rookie corners do make a lot of mistakes. And I think that the Lions, once again, they're, they're arguably the worst team in that division. They're going to be throwing a lot. And they're going to be throwing a lot to Galladay, Marvin Jones, uh, DeAndre Swift, and TJ Hawkinson. I like Stafford a lot here in the 11th round. 12th round, excuse me. Well, especially since Mike Beers, uh, you mentioned uh, Galladay and Marvin Jones, he happened to get the trio. So he has Stafford, Oh, I didn't even notice that. Nice, Jones, yeah, Galladay, nice eyes, so. yeah. 
Yep. So he just, you know, he did the same thing. That's interesting that these guys are doing, you know, he and Brian Tuminello get to you're getting a stack of two receivers. We haven't seen that. We saw it a little bit, but I mean, not getting both usually. You know, it's, and actually, it's funny because, you know, uh, Tuminello definitely kind of, I, you know, I'm not saying he reached, but he kind of reached on Roethlisberger because Roethlisberger probably would go at near the end of those seven quarterbacks. Uh, I don't know if Stafford necessarily is. Stafford kind of goes right in that range, it seems like. So it seems like that's more like normal. For uh, for where where yeah, they would that, generally go. That little go. glut right there? Yeah. To me, it seems like like Roethlisberger generally wouldn't go ahead of Stafford, Breeze, no. Rodgers. Usually he goes at, behind all those guys. Twelve oh two on average as quarterback 17. Which, I mean, that's it's a fine, it's actually a fine pick. But, I mean, that is like – and he probably wouldn't have got him in the 13th. Maybe he would have. I don't know. But uh, – I think he might. I mean, it, it, it kind of, you know, the thing is, it's like how many guys went with quarterbacks after Roethlisberger here? Uh, six. So you're talking about, you know, dodging six bullets there, which you might have been able to do. I saw he, Keanu Reeves do it in the Matrix. It's yeah. possible. And, but, he did, and he did need to take one quarterback pretty much. So he could have taken someone else and then gone for Roethlisberger. But if you want to get the stack going, then he just uh, he had to take him. That is the way to do it for sure. But, yeah, I didn't realize there was all these, uh, these, all these stacks going on tonight. We've got the Buck stack in the one spot. we got the Steelers stack in the 11 spot. you got the Lions stack in the 8 spot. That's an underrated one uh, for sure. Um, I, uh, it, okay, well, I'm moving on. I'm not going to say it yet. But uh, I got a joke all, all ready to go in the holster here, Dave. I think it's going to be a good one. Oh, boy. Percentage chance that Curtis Samuel is a Carolina Panther at week one. Is it a foregone conclusion? I still think he could get moved. I, I don't think he gets traded. So like 90%, 95%. Yeah, I'd say 95 Okay, perfect. Um, you still like Preston Williams, obviously, as do I. Uh, I feel like there is one other quarterback we should talk. Oh, I'll tell you a quarterback we can talk about. Another semi-polarizing guy as he sort of came on last year. What do you make of Daniel Jones? Uh, he's got some weapons, you know, maybe not an alpha receiver, but Evan Ingram is a, you know, consensus top six FFPC tight end this year. He's got Saquon Barkley out of the backfield to make things easier for him, uh, you know, when he runs the ball and he can also catch some passes too. And Daniel Jones, by the way, can use his legs to, uh, to his advantage, get some rushing stats too. Daniel Jones in the 12th round, I feel like I penalize him because I thought it was not a good pick by the Giants when they drafted him, but maybe I'm wrong here, and, and maybe that he's a guy that, that I should be looking at as, as a backup quarterback uh, for my best ball teams. You know, he was pretty productive. He had some really solid games. I, he had a few. I'm trying to look at, pull up his games, game logs, but uh, it seems like he had a few like four and five touchdown games last year, and it, I was actually pretty shocked. Maybe that's wrong. Um, he had a, a four touchdown game in week seven, a four touchdown game in week nine, and a five touchdown game in week twelve. That's pretty impressive for a rookie. I mean, it really is. He had, you know, and he had a pass rating of one twenty four, one twenty two, and one thirty two in those. Wow. Games. Yeah. So yeah, that's pretty solid. And like you said, he only started. Uh, he played thirteen games, but he had two hundred seventy nine rushing yards and two touchdowns. That's pretty again, pretty good uh, for someone that you don't you don't really think of him as. He looks like Eli, but he doesn't rush like Eli. So no. he rushes way better. So, yeah, I, he, yeah, I think I would consider him. Um, we, we talked about Cam Newton before, and we, we were talking about him in, in the sense of, hey, this is a good backup quarterback this year. Well, Chris Prince is going with him as his starting quarterback this year. I guess I can't ask you this yet to see if this is a strategy you would employ because we'll have to see who else he gets at quarterback. But right now, Cam Newton – I know he's, it's New England. I know he's a former MVP, but there's just something that doesn't feel right about him being my starter this year. Yeah, I know what you're saying. I mean, I mean you must, and there's quarterback is super deep and, you know, you can, you know, you, there's so many ways to play it and get, and get quarterbacks. I mean, those top six guys, I think, uh, you know, the, the middle, like Dak Prescott, Russell Wilson, Kyler Murray and Deshaun Watson are pretty reasonably priced. They really are. Right. And even like the next tier below them, you you can wait in this draft. You, know, you wait all that. Wait until the eleventh round, get Brady, or the late eleventh and get Josh Allen. I think that you can really attack it that way. And I think sometimes waiting another round or two and getting a guy like Cam Newton as your starter turns out to be not the best way to do it. I feel like quarterbacks fell in this draft relative to the other five yeah, pros versus Joe's uh, draft. Yeah, everyone is different. Uh, it's just, it's crazy. I know everybody always says that, but it, it really is true. Let's move on to the 13th round here. Jerry Judy goes off the board to Brian Pakula here at the 1301. That kicks off a little mini wide receiver run. Sammy Watkins to Chris Prince, John Brown to Todd Hopkins, and then Robbie Anderson to Michael Nazareth. 
uh, as he goes with the current Jets receiver in the 10th and the former Jets receiver here in the 13th. Eric Ebron's backing up Tyler Higby for James Boris here at the 1305. Deshaun Jackson, the number five wide receiver selected by Darren Armani. Uh, Peter St. Pierre and Steve Ashey go back to back with quarterbacks here as they get Drew Brees as their number two and then Joe Burrow as their number three in the 13th. Nikhil Harry off the board to Mike Beers uh, after that. Nikhil Harry is the uh, number five receiver drafted by the former 2017 PBJ overall champ. Uh, back-to-back tight ends here. O.J. Howard is the number three for Sky Eilers. Gerald Everett is the number three for Howard Bender. Paris Campbell off the board to Brian Tuminello. And then Drew Locke, the final pick, of the 13th round, Drew Locke, Dave, will be starting for Jeff Mann. Now, I said I was uncomfortable with Cam Newton as my number <laughs> one. I am highly un- – I feel like I should be sitting on one of those hemorrhoid pillows um, for having Drew Locke as my starting quarterback here. And he won't have the – now, he already made his 14th round pick. Too. He won't have the opportunity to draft another quarterback until round 15. This could get a, a little harrowing, a little nail-biting. But I guess he's already thrown caution to the wind with all those rookies. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Tua is still available. He can pick yeah, Tua. Yeah, exactly. Or Herbert. Yeah, yeah Herbert. Justin Herbert. Her- just, the Tua Herbert yeah. picks. <laughs> uh, certainly uh, possible. Where did I um, – I, this, I don't know where I saw this, somewhere on Twitter, but the ultimate Aaron Rodgers move would be opting out this year, like just opting out of the season. <laughs> and, and then you Someone can, said that? So it's like, yeah, it's like the total Aaron, it's like the classic Aaron Rodgers move to like, you know, show up the Packers. I'm, I'm not going to play. I'm out, yeah, exactly. I'm not going to play this season. And then have. And then, oh, you want Jordan Love? You yeah. Can you, have yeah. Him. Just here you go. You, you got know. what you wanted. You go jerk. Surfing. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Um, funny stuff there. Aaron <laughs> Rodgers is great, relatively speaking. Paris Campbell. He, his, he probably, <laughs> I feel like he treats people like Ellen. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I don't. That's that's another whole she story. That's his family unfolding. like Ellen. Yeah. Anyway, it's really bizarre. Paris Campbell, Dave, um, for the uh, Indianapolis Colts. Um, obviously T.Y. Hilton's there. You have Michael Pittman uh, there, who's a rookie. We underrating Paris Campbell because we, we don't talk about him a whole lot on this show because, well, quite frankly, he hasn't done much in, in the league so far. And then the Colts invested a second round pick into Michael Pittman. Um, that is an interesting question because I didn't like Campbell coming into the NFL last year, and I still don't really care for him that much. Having said that, um, and then you have Pittman to deal with, who's a different, seems like a different type of player, really, isn't he? I mean, yeah, you know, not a speed guy; he's more of a he's a bigger guy. Um, I don't know. I, I, I think I'd still be looking somewhere else other than taking Campbell. Uh, so I, I don't know. I'm still not that optimistic. I feel like he should have done more as a rookie for me to really get behind him. I don't necessarily want to bring up where they went tonight. I want to bring up their ADPs. Tyler Higby at the 609, Dave, is tight end seven. Gerald Everett, his uh, real-life teammate, tight end 28 at 1406. I like the value for Everett a lot better. Yeah, I do. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, and Everett was producing really well until that he got injured last year. And uh, why not take a shot? And the team's been talking him up. The coaching staff's been talking him up. Yeah, I like Everett. Uh, and, and Howard Bender gets him as his number three tight end. That's the, the, the really great thing about Everett this year is you can get him as your number three. You yeah. don't even have to draft, draft him as your backup. It, it's just tremendous value. It's a nice little luxury pick, actually. Moving on to the 14th round, Alan Lazard, the 1401 to Jeff Mann. It's kind of weird. Somebody needs to tell Manz that Lazard is uh, is not a rookie. Uh, so Lazard goes off the board at the 14.01. Ryan Tannehill is the second uh, selection in the 14th round tonight. Ryan Tannehill backing up um, uh, the quarterback that Brian Tuminello took in the 12th round. That's Ben Roethlisberger, as uh, he now has two quarterbacks going forward. Brashad Perriman to Howard Bender, followed by Brandon Ayuk, a guy that Dave and I have talked about liking this season. Sky Eilers takes him here at the 14.04. You have Dawson Knox as the third tight end off the board to Mike Beers. Uh, Dawson Knox, another guy, actually, that Dave and I like, and another guy that's awesome that you can get him as your number three tight end. You don't have to invest in Dawson Knox as your backup tight end unless you really wait long at the position. Justin Jefferson to St. Pierre and Ashy, followed by Joshua Kelly, the number six running back chosen by Darren Armani. You got Jared Goff, as the number three quarterback for James Boris here. Boris gets him at the 1408. Tua Tungavailoa sniped 
from Jeff Manns at the other end of the draft. Tua Tungavailoa is the number three quarterback drafted by Michael Nazarick. Then you get the Chiefs, uh, one of the Chiefs backup running backs, Darwin Thompson, a darling in fantasy leagues last year. Uh, Todd Hopkins snares him here with the third last pick of the 14th round. You have Gardner Minshew, uh, who apparently scares the the coronavirus right out of COVID-19. Gardner Minshew going at the 14-11 tonight. And then Darrington Evans, uh, the who we think is going to be the backup running back uh, in Tennessee, Darrington Evans, the final pick of the 14th round here this evening. Uh, touched on it before um, with uh, the, the Jets receivers here. Uh, you have Jamison Crowder going in the 10th. Brashad Perriman goes in the 14th. And, I, and we always talk about draft value and, you know, what's the better value? Who would you rather have? And normally I, I say, well, I'm rather going to go with the, the guy who goes later. I don't think I would in this case. I, I think I do, even though Crowder is going first uh, among Jets receivers, and I'm going to include the, the rookie in this as well, I think Crowder represents the better value here. As Brashad Perriman, for the last two years, Dave, has made a career or made his contract um, in the last month of the season. But for the, for the first three months, he doesn't really do that much. He's, he's not a very exciting player, but he comes on at the end. People remember that, and then he gets paid, and, and that's what he's that's done his, the last – that's the last two years, what he's done, and, it, and it's worked out for him. That's his M.O., huh? That is his M.O., for sure. Um, you Herman like, does have a little bit of a shot of being one of those late-developing players because he has he – has, he kind of come around. I, I do agree with you, though. I prefer uh, Crowder even at the elevated price. I'm going to go out to the uh, 610, uh, go to the phone lines right now. You are on the air with the, uh, Dave and Balky on the HSFF Hour. To whom are we speaking with? Uh, this is Jim Boris. I'm actually in the draft right now. All right. What's up? The FFPC Joe Jim Boris drafting in the five spot. How do you like your team so far, Jim? Uh, well, I just picked up Hunter Renfrew uh, with this last pick. Uh, you know, every draft's different. <laughs> you just got to adapt, my friend. Uh, you know, it's uh, it, n- nothing ever goes to plan. Um, I usually... And wide receiver heavy early, and this draft uh, didn't didn't bode well for that for me. So I always try and get the best player available when possible. But uh, yeah, it's fair. I have a fair team. Uh, I, I'm it, I'm not overexcited, and I'm not disappointed. Um, I don't know. You tell me what you think. <laughs> Well, Joe, let, let me ask you this. Uh, just curiously, when you knew you were going to have the five pick. I think the top four picks were pretty, um, you know, not run of the mill, but pr- pretty much what you'd expect to see here. Uh, did you kind of make up your mind that you're going to go with Michael Thomas at the 105 before the draft started? Absolutely. That, that for me, that was a no brainer. Anywhere, I, I, pro- I might have even taken him five, to be honest with you. I, 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 I I'm always, I always want the best or top two, top three in any position. Uh, so if I can get that uh, uh, best receiver in football, I'll take that all day long. When you talk about how your draft strategy changed, you normally are wide receiver heavy. You, you end up taking a quarterback in the second, followed by a couple of running backs after that. Did what, you know, did the rest of the board sort of dictate that? Like um, when you see all these running backs flying off the board, did you feel like, you know, I should probably get a couple of rushers here on my squad before it's too late? I needed to get one in the, you know, I needed to get four up there. Um, I was happy to get Johnson, the, you know, a couple rounds later that round or the, the next round or the following one after that. Um, me taking Mahomes in the second, I, I never take quarterbacks early. But you know what? Uh, being that this is best ball, um, being that, you know, again, Mahomes is the best quarterback in the game. Um, so I, I wanted, to, wanted to take advantage of that. I, I didn't want to get into a situation where a couple guys got into where they got – caught with they got caught naked without quarterbacks you know late um you know and that's 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 a big boo-boo you can't get caught without a quarterback um and then I was looking at Breeze I was looking at Breeze as my backup and he got taken two picks before me but can I really complain if I get Rodgers as my backup in the 12th or whatever it was (laughs) yeah exactly Uh, you know exactly I mean, I mean, okay, I didn't get Breeze. I got Rodgers. Oh, well. <laughs> so, so, Jim, outside of Michael Thomas, did you have a favorite pick, a favorite selection of yours tonight when, when, the, when you know, you were on the clock and you're like, yes, this guy made it to me. I'm so happy I can make this pick here. Did you have any of those moments tonight? Uh, I like the Shepard pick. 
I, I was looking at Shepard, um, you know, as a fourth receiver, not too bad. Um, best value there. Uh, I also, I also like the, 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 I know it's, it's silly, but I think you win, you win, win leagues late, uh, not in the first three rounds, but like rounds seven to 15 and, uh, the Murray pick I liked, plus it blocked the guy next to me so that he didn't have a backup, you know, so, so he, he didn't have the, uh, the handcuff to Murray, uh, to, um, um, Al, Alvin, uh, Kamara. So, so it kind of yeah, it, it, it helped me. For, it helped me for depth, and it, it it hurt you know hurt a guy next to me. You know, uh, not not to be mean, but it's it's competition, right? <laughs> yeah, it is. It, it's, it's, it is. Listen, you, it's a pro. Who cares about them? Im, improve your team, and and make sure the other teams cannot improve theirs. Uh, we talked uh, throughout pros versus Joe's Jim about the, um, the the Colts backfield and, and the Lions backfield. You snared a, a couple of pieces uh, from both of those uh, uh, teams tonight with Marlon Mack and Kerryon Johnson back to back in the seventh and eighth rounds. How do you view those splits this year? I mean, do you view them closer to fifty fifty than some other teams, or was this just basically trying to get a piece of that backfield in case something were to happen to Taylor or Swift? I like the guys I got. Rookies are going to not play a big part this year. COVID, COVID, and lack of practice and lack of reps, and uh, I think I think the rookies are going to be eased in because we nobody has any idea how they can pick up blitzes. Nobody has any, any idea if they know the playbook because reading it and knowing it in the classroom are totally different than ex- executing on the field. So uh, Mac for sure, and I and I trust me, I love. Jonathan Taylor, Jonathan Taylor, I, I love him, love him to death, but not not this year. Um, I think he's gonna, I think he's gonna get carries. Don't get me wrong, but I think Mac and Johnson, carrying on Johnson, are gonna, they're gonna have probably a 60-40, 65-35 split. But if it's a short season, we don't, because we don't know, we don't know if it's gonna go eight games, twelve games, sixteen games. I'm banking on everything. I'm, I, my strategy was to bank on a short season just in case. And if it's a short season, I don't want the guys that have the 35% that are going to dominate the second half of the year. I want who's dominating the first half of the year and can still still be a factor in the second half of the year. Jim, tell us who you're taking here in the 16th round. I have no idea. I've been talking to you guys. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> let's see. Oh shit! I got. Oh, sorry, sorry about that. Um, oh right. crap! Uh, right. Let's take a look at. Oh my goodness! I'm glad you guys are awake. Um, <laughs> uh, you know what? It's fu- let's let, let's go with. Uh, I'm, you know what? Let's go with D.D. Westbrook. D.D. Westbrook from Jacksonville. Uh, this is a balanced team yes. um, that that you have uh, so far, and I think you add to that wide receiver depth here. Uh, with Westbrook, especially if uh, Jacksonville is passing it a little bit more than you know, they're such a well, run-heavy team. They're going to be behind, last right? Last year, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. they're going and, and to have... be behind. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, you're going to have Minshew in year two. Yeah. Uh, you don't, you know, it, which is going to be better. I think they're going to be trailing a lot, and and you know, kind of, kind of the the one thing about Fournette too is, I, I you know, there's a good chance that uh, come come trade deadline, he might be tossed and might be a number one somewhere else. So that was kind of another thing because even, and, and listen, he had 75 catches last year out of the backfield. Um, so, you know, Fournette, Fournette, while he's there, uh, I like him. Um, and, uh, and the fact that if they're trailing, you know, he gets some cheap dump off passes. Uh, and then Didi, you know, Didi's due to break out anyway. Yeah, but it was a guy that was, well, he's a Heisman Trophy finalist, put up some pretty big numbers at Oklahoma. Uh, Jim Boris, who's put up pretty big numbers in the FFPC, putting up a good uh, score uh, for his team, at least by my standards tonight. We'll get into that later on in the program. Jim, I'm going to let you get back to the draft. Thanks so much for chiming in with us uh, tonight. Good luck the rest of the way, and good luck in the main event this year, man. Guys, thanks for the, uh, thanks for the kind words, and thanks for your time. Jim Boris, ladies and gentlemen, the FFPC Joe drafting tonight out of the five spot. I want to catch everybody up. We we told you what happened in the 14th round. Here's what took place in the 15th round. And another semi-quarterback round here, Dave. Jimmy Garoppolo leading things off to Brian Pakula here, followed by uh, Damian Harris right after that. 
Damien Harris to goes uh, goes to Chris Prince, excuse me, DeAndre Washington. Um, so you have Todd Hopkins going back to back Chiefs backups here. That's interesting. And the 14th and 15th gets Darwin Thompson and DeAndre Washington. Ito Smith, speaking of backups. Is the 1504 to Michael Nazarick, Hunter Renfro, and then Teddy Bridgewater to Boris and then Armani. Uh, Darren Armani takes Bridgewater as his backup to Dak. He's the Dak up, uh, as it were. Carlos Hyde. The jokes are terrible, but it's night six. This is what's going to happen, people. Carlos Hyde. <laughs> that, that was the, actually funnier than the other. <laughs> Carlos Hyde off the board to Peter St. Pierre and Steve Ashey. Right after that, followed by Naheem Hines. Like that value there in the 15th round, Naheem Hines uh, to Mike Beers. You have Kirk Cousins as the backup quarterback to Kyler Murray. Uh, that's for Sky Eilers there. You have Randall Cobb going off the board. Uh, the Houston Texans receiver to Howard Bender. Brian Tuminello then takes Greg Olson as his number three tight end. Philip Rivers backing up uh, 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 guru elite Jeff Mann's Drew Locke at his uh, starting quarterback position. So you, you get the young and then you get the old, Dave. You get the, the big arm and then the, the, the pop gun, essentially. With sure would be pissed. But there is something to be said for that, at least to get the, the veteran stability there when you wait on quarterback that long. I mean, at least you should be getting some That's true. production there. He's uh, not with in danger of losing his job or anything like that. No, yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, he is after the season, but he should be good to go for 2020. That's right. Uh, for certain. Tyler Eifert, then, is his number two tight end. See, now, this is something I would not do. I know he has George Kittle. I know he picked him in the first round. Dave, I can't condone waiting into the 16th round to pick a second tight end, especially when it's being uh, t- Tyler Paper Eifert. It's not, not good hoodoo to do that. Yep, I got to concur with that. Sam Darnold is the third quarterback selected by Brian Tuminello here at the 1602. You get a couple of uh, uh, running backs here, Jarek McKinnon and then Anthony McFarland to Bender and then Eilers. Golden Tate off the board to Mike Beers. A couple of uh, rookie tight ends then, Cole Komet uh, off the board, the Bears tight end, followed by Devin Asiasi to, uh, that's Darren Armani, I believe, right there, taking him. Yes, yeah, Darren Armani takes Devin Asiasi. Cole Komet went to St. Pierre and Ashy. Uh, D.D. Westbrook, you heard that pick live on the air by Jim Boris. You have LaShawn McCoy, another Buccaneers running back. LaShawn gumming up the works McCoy <laughs> as he goes at the 1609 tonight to Michael Nazarick. Derek Carr, third quarterback selected by Team 3, uh, Todd Hopkins. You have Corey Davis going off the board. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. Corey Davis in the 16th round tonight to Chris Prince. And then Justin Jackson, the uh, maybe backup running back for the Chargers. We're, we're not really sure how that's going to fall in yet. But Justin Jackson goes with the final pick of the 16th round here, Dave. And as we look at value in the past two rounds, I like the Damian Harris pick. What do you make of the Darwin Thompson, DeAndre Washington stack that Todd Hopkins did in the 14th and 15th? I think that's a good way to spend those two picks. Uh, personally, I would just go with DeAndre Washington and leave Thompson alone, but I don't think it's bad. I mean, if that's what he, you know, if he wants to give that a shot, and it makes a lot of sense. All you're really betting is that uh, Edward Solaire is, is somewhat of a, either injured or a bust, and both things or are, both. <laughs> yeah, are, both are totally possible. Uh, so I think that, that uh, that's a nice way to go. Do you um, – so uh, just curiously, you don't you think Darwin Thompson is the clear number three there then if you're just taking Washington, um, if, if you were going to do it? My opinion is that DeAndre Washington wins the number two job over Darwin Thompson, yeah. Okay, all right, fair enough. Um, speaking of other value in, in the 15th and 16th, um, I like the Hunter Renfro pick. I think that made sense for, for Jim Boris there. Uh, Carlos Hyde, I mean, say what you will about him. To get him in the 15th round behind the oft-injured Chris Carson, I think there's a lot of upside there, and I think that that's a guy that moves up draft boards as, as we get closer uh, to, uh, to Vegas and, and main event drafts really picking up steam. Uh, and Naheem Hines, obviously, uh, we're of one mind on that. And Randall Cobb, um, you know, <laughs> say what you will. Uh, about him say what you will what what he's done since he's left Aaron Rodgers and the Packers but this dude catches passes and there's a lot of them that just got vacated in that Houston Texans offense it's very true I mean he he catches touchdowns too pretty pretty well what do you make of Greg Olson in Seattle this year and he he, he had the foot issues last year he did all right when he was healthy he's gonna you know he's contending with Will Disley for snaps and obviously you got Metcalf and Lockett outside um going as like a, a you know the top 30 top 32 tight end though right now he's basically free um well i wouldn't say free but i would say that he's the last tight end that i could stomach how about that 
A more glowing endorsement you could not get for <laughs> Greg Olson. Well, because then you're looking at Eifert and then, like, the rookies. Uh, I mean, I, I guess Njoku, I guess there's something to be – I could look at Njoku. Right. Um, and then Yuzuma technically starts. So – and Darren Fells technically starts, too. I just I feel like the Asi Asi and Cole Komet picks, I just feel like it's just – the odds of those guys hitting as rookies where they ever start for you in a single game is so is so small. Right, yeah. So I just don't, I just don't see that. Um, so the other thing I'll bring up here, Dave, there are two tight ends that I know you like better that typically go after Greg Olson. They did not in tonight's draft, but Dawson Knox and Gerald Everett are both being selected after oh, Greg Olson. Okay. All right. so, I mean, yeah. they're, they're right around that same spot in the mid 14th. Sure, sure. Um, but, but I know you like those guys. Okay. Um, was there any other value you wanted to talk about in the 16th round? Nope. I, let's wrap it up. Okay. So I can move on to the 17th then. <laughs> we can do uh, we can do team evaluations before it's done. You know, do you want to do that now? We can sure. do that now. Let no, me, why not? Change my the 18th here. round is going to make a difference. That's a good point. All right, so kicking things off to some people have to wake up in the morning. Well, I, I mean, have I'm, to wake up too. It's I know not... I'm saying viewers, oh, or okay. listeners, yeah. or whatever. Right. I, I can, can't tell. I didn't know if you were sub touting yourself or not. Uh, Brian Pakula. Uh, I don't know how to do that. I just tell myself. <laughs> kicking things off at quarterback. <laughs> That's very funny. Lamar Jackson and Jimmy Garoppolo are the quarterbacks. Christian McCaffrey, Ronald Jones, Keyshawn Vaughn, Antonio Gibson, Darrington Evans, Justin Jackson at running back. Chris Godwin, Cortland Sutton, Brandon Cooks, Christian Kirk, Henry Ruggs, Jerry Judy at receiver, Darren Waller, Austin Hooper, and David Njoku at tight end. Very well-balanced team. It's a team I can get on board with. Uh, he's going to need that Buccaneers running back tandem to come through because besides that, he's got some question marks in Christian McCaffrey, which honestly covers up a lot of warts. Yeah, if any of those flyer running backs pan out, he's in good shape. I thought he got a nice value on the, um, the Chris Godwin pick. I mean, Godwin went at the end of the first round in one of these drafts. Right. I mean, taking Lamar Jackson, that happened yesterday to McCaffrey and Lamar Jackson. So many points that they produced like they did last year. And Waller and Hooper are good. I mean, um, really good at tight end. I like this team overall, but, I mean, it's, there's, some risk, there's risk at RB2, but I get it. I get that. That's why he went that way. Roto Grinders' Chris Prince was in the second spot tonight. Here's what he did with it. Cam Newton and Gardner Minshew at quarterback. Saquon Barkley, Todd Gurley, J.K. Dobbins, Tevin Coleman, Damian Harris, and Adrian Peterson at running back. Uh, the receivers are Robert Woods, Tyler Lockett, Debo Samuel, Anthony Miller, Sammy Watkins, and Corey Davis. Uh, tight ends, Mark Andrews, Rob Gronkowski, T.J. Hawkinson. Really good tight end trio there, Dave. Uh, I think the running backs are there. There's some good upside there. Uh, the, the question is, can he get a third quarterback, um, you know, the, of any kind of ilk? And then um, the receivers, I, I guess I'm a little nervous that Debo Samuel is my number three. And then you have Sammy Watkins as, as the five and Corey Davis as the six. So there's some question marks there. Yeah. Receivers kind of where I'm concerned uh, when you have Andrews and Gronk and Hawkinson, though, I mean, that, that does that that's, that's why. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I I I would need to have more receivers on my team. That that's the way I would probably go. But I thought the Dobbins pick again. I thought that was pretty solid too in the in the seventh. Yeah, considering where Ingram went for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, Todd Hopkins, Tom Brady, Baker Mayfield, and Derek Carr at quarterback. Ezekiel Elliott, Aaron Jones, Raheem Mostert, uh, Mostert, excuse me, Devin Singletary, Tony Pollard, Darwin Thompson, DeAndre Washington at running back. Mike Evans, Cooper Cup, Devontae Parker, and John Brown at receiver. John Smith, Jack Doyle, Will Disley at tight end. Dave, I'm not a fan of Will Disley, um, so Smith and Doyle might not be the greatest combo for, for being top two tight ends. Running backs are really good. Quarterbacks are really good. Receivers really lacking here, though. I guess my that's my issue to only have four of them where John Brown's your four. Eh, not something I can get on board with. Yeah, I feel like maybe he just took a little bit, a little bit too many uh, running backs. I mean, after you have, you know, with Elliott, Jones, Mostert, and Singletary getting a really nice value there in the seventh, he po- could have possibly even left running back alone. And then you have to tie up two spots on the Kansas City uh, second and third stringers. He could have grabbed some more receivers there. That's probably what I would have done. Fantasy football masterminds Michael Nazarick was the pro in the four spot. He gets Matt Ryan, Daniel Jones, and Tua Tungavailoa at quarterback. Alvin Kamara, Le'Veon Bell, Philip Lindsay, Duke Johnson, Ito Smith, and LaShawn McCoy at running back. Receivers, Julio Jones, DK Metcalf, Jarvis Landry, Jamison Crowder, Robbie Anderson. Tight ends are Zach Ertz, Jared Cook, and Darren Fells. Another pretty well-balanced team. I mean, he took some stabs at running back late, which I think he needed to do. Um, the, uh, the receivers, I think, are solid. It, it, this is a team that I think is well-balanced all the way around. It's not a team that really excites me as, as a potential contender, even though I think it might be. I think, yeah, I think he has a good shot to contend. It, it's, um, 
I, I can't really find a lot of faults with it. Actually, right. I like, yeah. lot, I like a lot of the players he picked and when he took them, where and where he took them. Uh, I do. Actually, I think I like his team a little bit more than you do. Jim Boris in the five spot tonight. We talked to him earlier. Uh, I told him we give him our evaluation. Here's where it is. It's uh, awesome. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, exactly. And that's it. Moving on. Darren Armani. Uh, Patrick Mahomes and Aaron Rodgers, along with Jared Goff, uh, as his quarterbacks. The running backs are Leonard Fournette, David Johnson, Marlon Mack, Carrion Johnson, Latavius Murray, and Benny Snell. Uh, receivers, Michael Thomas, Keenan Allen, Julian Edelman, Sterling Shepard, Hunter Renfro, D.D. Westbrook. Tight ends, Tyler Higby, Eric Ebron, and C.J. Uzuma. I like this team. I was going to tell him, too, when he was on the clock, I, you know, you could probably use another tight end here. He doesn't take it while he's on the phone with us, but the very next pick, I take C.J. Uzuma, who is a starter, and I think that brings the team together nicely. Again, another well-balanced team here uh, that, that could do some damage. Yeah, I, th- I, think, I think he did pretty well. I mean, if uh, Higby, if the, half the Twitter people that like Higby, if he's on that right, <laughs> right half, yeah, he's going to be in good shape. I, I like the way his team turned out. Fournette and David Johnson – Really solid to get your number one and number two running backs. Still have Mahomes and Michael Thomas. Uh, so, yeah, he started out really well. And, uh, you know, the later picks like Edelman is a nice pick. Renfro is a good pick. Uh, so, yeah, he did really well. The PVJ godfather, Darren Armani from Fantasy Mojo, was in the sixth spot tonight. Dak Prescott, Teddy Bridgewater, and Dwayne Haskins at quarterback. Running backs are Dalvin Cook, Austin Eckler, uh, Darius Geis, Boston Scott, Chase Edmonds, Joshua Kelly. Receivers, DJ Moore, Amari Cooper, Terry McLaurin, Michael Gallup, uh, Deshaun Jackson, and Josh Reynolds. Tight ends are Blake Jarwin, Chris Herndon, and Devin Asiasi. And therein lies my question mark here for this team. Jarwin needs uh, to, to be competent. I, if Chris Herndon does what he's capable of doing, I think he'll be all right there. I, I have low expectations for Devin Asiasi year one, but again, another well-balanced team. I think he did good at the key positions of running back and receiver. Yeah, I have concerns at tight end, and then also um, I'm not a big Darius Geis fan, so then at the number three running back, although I like Boston Scott, Edmonds, Kelly, those all made a lot of sense. Who's the starter in Washington? Is it Geis? I think technically. Okay, all right. I wasn't doing that to troll you. I was just, that was a legit question. I didn't know. I mean, um, who else would it be? Adrian, Adrian Peterson. Yeah. Oh. I, I just, yeah. Um, okay. So moving on to Peter St. Pierre and Steve Ashey here, you have Carson Wentz, Drew Brees and Joe Burrow at quarterback. The running backs are Joe Mixon, Josh Jacobs, Chris Carson, Matt Breida and Carlos Hyde. Uh, receivers, Calvin Ridley, T.Y. Hilton, Tyler Boyd, Emmanuel Sanders, Justin Jefferson, and Alshon Jeffrey at receiver. Then you have Noah Fant, Jay Sternberger, Cole Komet, and Kyle Rudolph at tight end. Uh, the, the, the running backs are obviously awesome. I, I like the, the fact that he got Hyde, uh, that they got Hyde to go with Carson. Um, receivers, I, I think he needed one more here. Emmanuel Sanders is your four is fine, but Justin Jefferson is a rookie is your five, and then Alshon Jeffrey, who is – you know, I can't expect literally anything for that guy. And then I, I think there's a lot of potential at tight end, Dave, but there's a lot of question marks there with all that youth. Yeah, I agree with you on the tight end spot. I mean, I know you like Sternberger, but it's like with Fant and Sternberger and is really leading your team, that's a, that's a problem for me a little bit. I think taking Joe Burrow was a little bit of a luxury pick. They could have taken a receiver in that spot and then grabbed some crappier tight end or crappier quarterback later. And then, yeah, I don't get the Jeffrey pick. That's to me is just like kind of a waste. But, I mean, you know, if, I guess technically he could come back. Yeah, well, I mean, I, he's going to try. Yeah. It won't be from lack of trying. Yeah. Um, okay, moving on to the 2017 PBJ champ, Mike Beers from rotoviz.com. Russell Wilson and Matthew Stafford at quarterback. Running back, Clyde Edwards-Alaire, Kenyon Drake, Melvin Gordon, Tariq Cohen, Naheem Hines. Receivers, Kenny Galladay. Stephon Diggs, Will Fuller, Marvin Jones, Nikhil Harry, Golden Tate, LaVisca Chenault, and John Ross. Tight ends are Evan Ingram, Ian Thomas, and Dawson Knox. I really like this team, Dave. And the reason for, you know, that, that, that I'm saying I like it a lot is, granted, he only drafted five running backs, but look at the back end. Pass catcher Cohen, pass catcher Hines. Um, and then you look at, he, I think he kind of knew, like, look, my receivers aren't the greatest in the world. So he dedicates four of his final picks to the receiver position, and I thought he got a lot of upside with Engram, Thomas, and Knox at tight end. Part of the reason he was able to do that only took two quarterbacks, which I think is all you need when you have Wilson and Stafford. You know, I can't really add much to your comments, although you know maybe I'm not as big of a fan of uh, Gordon as uh, as maybe you are. But uh, yeah, team turned out really well, even even with uh, being settled with Will Fuller. 
Yes, now that's the other thing too. It's like if I draft a Will Fuller, I'm like I got to draft a receiver at every 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 pick from here on. I got to rag on Will Fuller. Um, Will Fuller could be could be great. Pretty great, yeah. yeah. We've Will seen a lot of smart people in PBJ this year uh, draft them for sure. All right, so moving on here to Sky Eilers, the former pros versus Joe's league champ. You have Kyler Murray and Kirk Cousins as his two quarterbacks. Uh, Derrick Henry, Miles Sanders, Jonathan Taylor, James White, Anthony McFarlane, and Devontae Freeman at running back. A.J. Brown, D.J. Chark, Marquise Brown, C.D. Lamb, Preston Williams, Brandon Ayuk, Larry Fitzgerald uh, at receiver, Mike Jasicki, Irv Smith, and O.J. Howard um, at tight end. Uh, so this is another kind of well-balanced team as far as team construction goes, but nobody's in danger of getting their AARP card uh, among the receivers, Dave. There is a ton of inexperience there when you look past, um, well, not even when you look past Brown and Chark. I mean, you can make the case that they're good, but they're also very young. And then you get Marquise Brown in his second year, and Lamb, the rookie, Preston Williams, who was technically in his second year but really didn't play uh, full season last year, Ayak, the rookie, and then, of course, the Mr. Long in the Tooth the grizzled veteran of the bunch, keeping everybody in There's line, Larry the Fitzgerald. There is the arbitrary. Yeah. yeah, he's the only one. Yeah, I, uh, it's a very young receiver core. Uh, I, I thought the value on Miles Sanders is really nice. In the yeah, round. So absolutely. I didn't really talk much about that. That was a really nice pick. I, even, you know, I've been kind of semi-down on Marquise Brown, but Marquise Brown, if he stays healthy, he, you know, he could have a lot of explosive weeks. I, I like how his receivers kind of turned out, especially with the later guys. Um, I think I'm a little higher, you know, you know, Preston Williams, we talked about, we like him. But, and then Brandon Ayak, I think, in the 14th worked out well for him. Uh, tight end, we'll see how that turns out. I, I, I'm a little bit not as big of a huge Irv Smith fan as a lot of the fantasy pundits. Right. Are, so I don't, I don't know what about, I don't know how that's going to turn out. Howard Bender from Fantasy Alarm was picking in the 10 spot tonight. He went with Deshaun Watson and Josh Allen as his quarterbacks. The running backs are Nick Chubb, James Conner, Jordan Howard, Sony Michelle, Jarek McKinnon, and Lynn Bowden. Then you have at wide receiver DeAndre Hopkins, Allen Robinson, Darius Slayton, Curtis Samuel, Brashad Perriman, Randall Cobb, and Steven Sims. Tight ends are Hunter Henry, Hayden Hurst, and Gerald Everett. Dave, I love the tight ends and quarterbacks, not so much the running backs and receivers. Uh, it's, it took a lot of players that I've, I will not be taking on my teams this year. Yeah, I, I agree with you there. And I think that he, you know, taking Chubb a little early and Hopkins a little bit technically early, but I mean, that's fine. Um, yeah, there's a lot of the, the running backs and receivers are guys that I just not not huge fans of. So I think that does impact my evaluation as well. Yeah, I'm not not a Howard guy, not a Michelle guy. Uh, Slayton is your number three. Curtis Samuels are four, and I do like the Randall Cobb pick late, and that Stephen Sims selection could work out as well. Um, moving on to Brian Tuminello here in the 11 spot. He went with Ben Roethlisberger, Ryan Tannehill, and Sam Darnold at quarterback. Running backs are David Montgomery, Kareem Hunt, Alexander Madison, AJ Dillon, and Ryquell Armstead. Receivers are Tyreek Hill, Juju Smith-Schuster, Adam Thielen, Deontay Johnson, McCole Hardman, Paris Campbell, and Jalen Hurd. Tight ends, Travis Kelsey uh, and Dallas Goddard, along with Greg Olson. He was the last team, I believe, to take a running back, Dave, and it kind of shows, as, as I'm not a huge fan of the stable. The first two were fine. Madison is your three. Eh, A.J. Dillon is your four. That's really not good. Um, and then um, uh, he, he obviously got the Pittsburgh stack uh, at, at receiver, but this team will go as far as the, the running backs can carry him. And unfortunately, uh, he doesn't have a lot of them, and he waited until the fourth round to take his first one. Fifth round, excuse me. Yeah, I, I agree. Fourth round, sorry. <laughs> I agree with what you're saying about the running backs. They both, the two top guys need to stay healthy and be productive. And so I just don't see it. You know, I, I, just, I just don't, I don't see that that's going to be. And then during bye week season, they have issues. Great job waiting on quarterback, though, Brian. Love it. Man after my own heart. Uh, final team we're going to evaluate for the entire pros versus Joe's competition. It's Jeff Manns from Guru Elite here, and he ends up with Drew Locke and Phillip Rivers at quarterback. Running backs are Cam Akers, DeAndre Swift, Mark Ingram, Zach Moss, Daryl Henderson, and Chris Thompson. Receivers, Devontae Adams, Odell Beckham, A.J. Green, Mike Williams, Jalen Rager, Michael Pittman, and Alan Lazard. Tight ends are George Kittle, Tyler Eifert, and Jimmy Graham. Very top-heavy at tight end. Um, I think he waited too long to, to grab his second one. Uh, I, 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 you know, the combo of Locke and Rivers does not really give me any kind of, of trust that, that they're going to be able to pull this off week in and week out. And just a lot of youth on this team. I mean, I get Adams, Beckham, and Green as your top three receivers. That's cool. But then you're counting on Rager. You're counting on Pittman, Akers, Swift, uh, Zach Moss on this team. It's just too many rookies, Dave. Too many rookies. I, that's uh, that's I totally in agreement with that. 
too many rookies and uh, too many podcasts. God, we've done six of these now, and we're going to put this one in the can. Ladies and gentlemen, that is going to put a wrap on the 2020 Pros versus Joes competition, our coverage of it at least, with the High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour. I want to thank Jim Boris for calling in, Darren Armani for putting this whole thing together, uh, Dave Gerzak, the FFPC, our producer and mutual friend Rob, audio engineer, my best friend Bryce, and of course, most importantly, all of you listeners out there, thank you so much for listening to all these podcasts as well. Uh, if you do like us covering live drafts, we ain't done yet. We got one more to cover before the start of the NFL season. That is going to be this Friday. It is the live on the High Stakes Fantasy Football or Football Guys Players Championship. All these guys signed up. They'll be playing for a half million bucks on Friday night trying to win that. Uh, coming up in that draft, we'll have a lot of former guests of the show. Wayne Ferguson, Chris Carlson, Vince Staffolino, Jimmy Wagner, who you can hear on the High Stakes Lowdown this coming Thursday. Bip Lab man. Dell, who's the defending champion. Bip Labs actually won this league twice now. You have John Terry in this, Dean Sykes, and Jim Corcoran will be drafting in this. Our good buddy Ray Chung, along with the, the Ivy League professor, Hudson Kern Reeve, uh, is going to be drafting in this. Frank Imbornoni, David, Avid- David Avidisian, and Jeff Hirshhorn, and Liz Ballard all going to be participating in this draft Friday night. It is going to be on an hour early, 9, 8 central, for our broadcast on Friday. And we'll be with you for the duration of that draft, too. Can't wait to talk about kickers and defenses. Here. Oh, thank God. We'll uh, get into the analysis. I saw uh, the Ravens talking, D, I'm going to talk like, about them. Everybody's, there's like all these opt outs with the Patriots. You guys, you can get them in the 19th round. Somebody was tweeting that on, on a football guy's draft. Oh, yeah. uh, anyway, which is totally true. Remember to make your plan at Hollywood Reservations, sign up for the main event, save $400 off each additional team, and check out those Football Guys Players Championship drafts. They're filling each and every day. Your week officially continues This has been another now. episode of the High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour presented by MyFFPC.com that was broadcast live and heard around the world. Eric and Dave will be back next week with more analysis, interviews, and advice from a guest much smarter than they are. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk with you again next week. Is this the first time we made it through six pros versus Joes and we didn't make a I got five on it wager? Um, I feel like we always like make one or two. We, I don't yeah, think we, we made were, any this year. We were too agreeable. <laughs> I mean, that's what it was. Oh. We're just we're dialing in. Like uh, we're we're just agreeing about too many players over the years. Ah, uh, those were the days, year one of the HSFFR, when we never agreed, and now we always agree. No, we're going to disagree on Friday. Let's do it. Let's at least get one better. I think Harrison Butker's a terrible pick. Yeah, exactly. All right, getting warmed up for it. We'll talk to you on Friday, everybody. It's going to be a lot of fun. Thanks for listening.